አድማጆቻችን ያው እንኳን በደህና ቆያችሁን ይያልኩኝ የዛሬው ትብይታችን የቡክ ሪቪው ነው ማይ አይ ሚን ካርል የካርል ቮን ክላስ ዊትስ ኦን ዋር ሚሎነ መጽሐፍ ኦዲዮ ነው እናዳምጣው ማለት ነው በጣም ኢምፖርታንት የሆነ በተለያየ ለስትራቴጂክ ቲንኪንግ የሚረዳ መንበብ ያለበት ቡክ ስለሆነ ያንን ያው በኦዲዮ መልክ እናቀርባለን ማለት ነው መልካም ቆይታ ታችን ይጀምራል This is a LibriVox recording Introduction of On War This is a LibriVox recording All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain For more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Timothy Ferguson On War by Karl von Clausewitz Translated by Colonel J. J. Graham. Introduction. The Germans interpret their new national colors, black, red, and white, by the saying, Der Nacht und Blut zur Licht, through night and blood to light, and no work yet written conveys to the thinker a clearer conception of all that the red streak in their flag stands for than this deep and philosophical analysis of war by Clausewitz. It reveals war stripped of all accessories as the exercise of force for the attainment of a political object unrestrained by any law save that of expediency and thus gives the key to the interpretation of German political aims past present and future which is unconditionally necessary for every student of the modern conditions of Europe step by step Every event since Waterloo follows with logical consistency from the teachings of Napoleon formulated for the first time some 20 years afterwards by this remarkable thinker. What Darwin accomplished for biology generally Clausewitz did for the life history of nations nearly half a century before him. For both have proved the existence of the same law in each case is the survival of the fittest. The fittest as Huxley long since pointed out not necessarily being synonymous with the ethically best neither of these thinkers was concerned with the ethics of the struggle which each studied so exhaustively but to both men the phase or condition presented itself neither as moral nor immoral any more than are famine disease or other natural phenomena but as emanating from a force inherent in all living organisms which can only be mastered by understanding its nature it is in that spirit that one after the other all the nations of the continent taught such drastic lessons as koningratz and sedan have accepted the lesson with the result that today europe is an armed camp and peace is maintained by the equilibrium of forces and will continue just as long as this equilibrium exists and no longer whether this state of equilibrium is in itself a good or desirable thing may be open to argument i have discussed it at length in my war in the world's life but i venture to suggest that no one would a renewal of the era of warfare be a change for the better as far as existing humanity is concerned meanwhile however with every year that elapses the forces at present in equilibrium are changing in magnitude the pressure of populations which have to be fed is rising and an explosion along the line of least resistance is sooner or later inevitable as i read the teaching of the recent hague conference no responsible government on the continent is anxious to form in themselves that line of least resistance they know only too well what war would mean and we alone absolutely unconscious of the trend of the dominant thought of europe are pulling down the dam which may at any moment let in on us the flood of invasion now no responsible man in europe perhaps least of all in germany thanks us for this voluntary destruction of our defences for all who are of any importance would very much rather end their days in peace than incur the burden of responsibility which war would entail but they realize that the gradual dissemination of the principles taught by clausewitz has created a condition of molecular tension in the minds of the nations they govern analogous to the critical temperature of water heated above boiling point under pressure which may at any moment 
bring about an explosion which they will be powerless to control. The case is identical with that of an ordinary steam boiler, delivering so-and-so many pounds of steam to its engines, as long as the envelope can contain the pressure, but let a breach in its continuity arise, relieving the boiling water of all restraint, and in a moment the whole mass flashes into vapour, developing a power no work of man can oppose. The ultimate consequences of defeat no man can foretell. The only way to avert them is to ensure victory, and again, following out the principles of Clausewitz, victory can only be ensured by the creation in peace of an organisation which will bring every available man, horse and gun, or ship and gun if the war be on the sea, in the shortest possible time and with the utmost possible momentum upon the decisive field of action which in turn leads to the final doctrine formulated by von der Goltz in excuse for the action of the late President Kruger in 1899. The statesman who, knowing his instrument to be ready, and seeing war inevitable, hesitates to strike first, is guilty of a crime against his country. It is because this sequence of cause and effect is absolutely unknown to our members of Parliament, elected by popular representation, that all our efforts to ensure a lasting peace by securing efficiency with economy in our national defences have been rendered nugatory. This estimate of the influence of Klutzewitz's sentiments on contemporary thought in continental Europe may appear exaggerated to those who have not familiarised themselves with M. Gustave de Bon's exposition of the laws governing the formation and conduct of crowds. I do not wish for one minute to be understood as asserting that Clausewitz has been conscientiously studied and understood in any army, not even in the Prussian, but his work has been the ultimate foundation on which every drill regulation in Europe, except our own, has been reared. It is this ceaseless repetition of his fundamental ideas to which one half of the male population of every continental nation has been subjected for two to three years of their lives, which has turned their minds to vibrate in harmony with its precepts, and those who know and appreciate this fact at its true value have only to strike the necessary chords in order to evoke a response sufficient to overpower any other ethical conception which those who have not organised their forces beforehand can appeal to. The recent setback by the socialists in Germany is an illustration of my position. The socialist leaders of that country are far behind the responsible governors in their knowledge of the management of crowds. The latter had not long before, in 1893 in fact, made their arrangements to prevent the spread of socialistic propaganda beyond certain useful limits. As long as the socialists only threatened capital, they were not seriously interfered with, for the government knew quite well that the undisputed sway of the employer was not for the ultimate good of the state. The standard of comfort must not be pitched too low if men are to be ready to die for their country. But the moment the socialists began to interfere seriously with the discipline of the army, the word went round, and the socialists lost heavily at the polls. If this power of predetermined reaction to acquired ideas can be evoked successfully in a manner of internal interest only, in which the obvious interest of the majority of the population is so clearly on the side of the socialist, it must be evident how enormously greater it will prove when set in motion against an external enemy, where the obvious interest of the people is, from the very nature of things, as manifestly on the side of the government, and the statesman who failed to take into account the force of the resultant thought wave of a crowd of some seven million men, all trained to respond to their ruler's call, would be guilty of treachery as grave as one who failed to strike when he knew the army to be ready for immediate action. As already pointed out, it is to the spread of Clausewitz's ideas that the present state of more or less immediate readiness for war of all European armies is due, and since the organisation of these forces is uniform, this more or less of readiness exists in precise proportion to the sense of duty which animates the several armies. Where the spirit of duty and self-sacrifice is low, the troops are unready and inefficient, where, as in Prussia, these qualities, by the training of the whole century, have become instinctive, troops really are ready to the last button and might be poured down upon any one of her neighbours with such rapidity that the very first collision must suffice to ensure ultimate success. A 
success by no means certain if the enemy, whoever he may be, is allowed breathing time in which to set his house in order. An example will make this clearer. In 1887, Germany was on the very verge of war with France and Russia. At that moment, her superior efficiency, the consequence of this inborn sense of duty, surely one of the highest qualities of humanity, was so great that it is more than probable that less than six weeks should have sufficed to bring the French to their knees. Indeed, after the first fortnight, it would have been possible to begin transferring troops from the Rhine to the Niemen. And the same case may arise again, but if France and Russia had been allowed even ten days' warning, the German plan would have been completely defeated. France alone might then have claimed all the efforts that Germany could have put forth to defeat her. Yet there are politicians in England so grossly ignorant of the German reading of the Napoleonic lessons that they expect that nation to sacrifice the enormous advantage they have prepared by a whole century of self-sacrifice and practical patriotism by an appeal to a court of arbitration and the further delays which must arise by going through the medieval formalities of recalling ambassadors and exchanging ultimatums. Most of our present-day politicians have made their money in business, a form of human competition greatly resembling war, to paraphrase Clausewitz. Did they, when in the throes of such competition, send formal notice to their rivals of their plans to get the better of them in commerce? Did Mr. Carnegie, the arch-priest of peace at any price, when he built the steel trust, notify his competitors when and how he proposed to strike the blows which successively made him master of millions? Surely the directors of a great nation may consider the interests of their shareholders, that is, the people they govern, as sufficiently serious not to be endangered by the deliberate sacrifice of the predominant position of readiness, which generations of self-devotion, patriotism, and wise forethought have won for them. As regards the strictly military side of this work, though the recent researches of the French general staff into the records and documents of the Napoleonic period have shown conclusively that Clausewitz had never grasped the essential point of the great emperor's strategic method, yet it is to be admitted that he has completely fathomed the spirit which gave life to the form, and notwithstanding the variations in application which have resulted from the progress of invention in every field of national activity, not in the technical improvements in armament alone, this spirit still remains the essential factor in the whole matter. Indeed, if anything, modern appliances have intensified its importance. For though, with equal armaments on both sides, the form of battles must always remain the same, the facility and certainty of communication, which better methods of communicating orders and intelligence have conferred upon the commanders, has rendered the control of great masses immeasurably more certain than it was in the past. Men kill each other at greater distances, it is true, but killing is a constant factor in all battles. The difference between now and then lies in this, that thanks to the enormous increase in range, the essential feature in modern armaments, it is possible to concentrate, by surprise, on any chosen spot a man-killing power fully twenty-fold greater than was conceivable in the days of Waterloo, and whereas in Napoleon's time this concentration of man-killing power, which in his hands took the form of the great case-shot attack, depended almost entirely on the shape and condition of the ground, which might or might not be favourable. Nowadays, such concentration of firepower is almost independent of the country altogether. Thus, at Waterloo, Napoleon was compelled to wait till the ground became firm enough for his guns to gallop over. Nowadays, every gun at his disposal, and five times that number had he possessed them, might have been opened on any point in the British position he had selected, as soon as it became light enough to see. Or, to take a more modern instance, viz. the Battle of saint Gravelotte, 18 August 1870, where the Germans were able to concentrate on both wing batteries of 200 guns and upwards. It would have been practically impossible, owing to the section of the slopes of the French position, to carry out the old-fashioned case-shot attack at all. Nowadays, there would be no difficulty in turning on the fire of 2,000 guns on any point of the position,
switching this fire up and down the line, like water from a fire engine hose, if the occasion demanded such concentration. But these alterations in method make no difference in the truth of the picture of war which Clausewitz presents, with which every soldier, and above all every leader, should be saturated. Death, wounds, suffering, and privation remain the same, whatever the weapons employed, and their reaction on the ultimate nature of man is the same now as in the struggle a century ago. It is this reaction that the great commander has to understand and prepare himself to control, and the task becomes ever greater as, fortunately for humanity, the opportunities for gathering experience become more rare. In the end, and with every improvement in science, the result depends more and more on the character of the leader and his power of resisting the sensuous impressions of the battlefield. Finally, for those who would fit themselves in advance for such responsibility, I know of no more inspiring advice than that given by Krishna to Anjuna ages ago, when the latter trembled before the awesome responsibility of launching his army against the host of the Pandavs. This life within all living things, my prince, hides beyond harm. Scorn thou to suffer, then, for that which cannot suffer. Do thy part, be mindful of thy name, and tremble not. Nought better can betide a martial soul than lawful war. Happy the warrior, to whom comes joy of battle. But if thou shunst this honourable field, a kishitria, if, knowing thy duty and thy task, thou bidst duty and task go by, that shall be sin. And those to come shall speak thee in infamy from age to age, but infamy is worse for men of noble blood to bear than death. Therefore arise thou, son of Kunti. Brace thine arm for the conflict. Nerve thy heart to meet, as things are like to thee, pleasure or pain, profit or ruin, victory or defeat. So minded, gird thee to the fight, for so thou shall not sin. Colonel F. N. Maud, C.B., late R.E. End of introduction. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Preface to the first edition of On War. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda and Timothy Ferguson. On War by Carl von Clausewitz. Translated by Colonel J. J. Graham. Preface to the first edition. It will naturally excite surprise that a preface by a female hand should accompany a work on such a subject as the present. For my friends, no explanation of the circumstance is required, but I hope, by a simple relation of the cause, to clear myself of the appearance of presumption in the eyes also of those to whom I am not known. The work to which these lines serve as a preface occupied almost entirely the last twelve years of the life of my inexpressibly beloved husband, who has unfortunately been torn too soon from myself and his country. To complete it was his most earnest desire, but it was not his intention that it should be published during his life, and if I tried to persuade him to alter that intention, he often answered half in jest, but also perhaps half in foreboding of early death, Thou shalt publish it. These words, which in those happy days often drew tears from me, little as I was inclined to attach a serious meaning to them, make it now, in the opinion of my friends, a duty incumbent on me to introduce the posthumous works of my beloved husband, with a few prefatory lines from myself, and although here may be a difference of opinion on this point, Still, I am sure there will be no mistake as to the feeling which has prompted me to overcome the timidity which makes any such appearance, even in a subordinate part, so difficult for a woman. It will be understood as a matter of course that I cannot have the most remote intention of considering myself as the real editress of a work which is far above the scope of my capacity. I only stand at its side 
as an affectionate companion on its entrance into the world. This position I may well claim, as a similar one was allowed me during its formation and progress. Those who are acquainted with our happy married life and know how we shared everything with each other, not only joy and sorrow, but also every occupation, every interest of daily life, will understand that my beloved husband could not be occupied on a work of this kind without its being known to me. Therefore, no one can, like me, bear testimony to the zeal, to the love with which he laboured on it, to the hopes which he bound up with it, as well as the manner and the time of its elaboration. His richly gifted mind had from his early youth longed for light and truth, and, varied as were his talents, still he had chiefly directed his reflection to the science of war, to which the duties of his profession called him, and which were of such importance for the benefits of the States. Scheinhorst was the first to lead him into the right road, and his subsequent appointment in 1810 as instructor at the General War School, as well as the honour conferred on him at the same time, of giving military instruction to His Royal Highness the Crown Prince, tended further to give his investigations and studies that direction, and to lead him to put down in writing whatever conclusions he arrived at. A paper with which he finished the instruction of His Royal Highness the Crown Prince contains the germ of his subsequent work, but it was in the year 1816, at Koblenz, that he first devoted himself again to scientific labours, and to collecting the fruits which his rich experience in those four eventful years had brought to maturity. He wrote down his views, in the first place in short essays, only loosely connected with each other. The following, without date, which has been found amongst his papers, seems to belong to those early days. In the principles here committed to paper, in my opinion, the chief things which compose strategy, as it is called, are touched upon. I look upon them only as materials, and had just got to such a length towards the moulding them into a whole. These materials had been amassed without any regularly preconceived plan. My view was, at first, without regard to system and strict connection, to put down the results of my reflections upon the most important points in quite brief, precise, compact propositions. The manner in which Montesquieu has treated his subject floated before me in idea. I thought that concise, sententious chapters, which I proposed at first to call grains, would attract the attention of the intelligent, just as much by that which was to be developed from them as by that which they contained in themselves. I had, therefore, before me in idea, intelligent readers already acquainted with the subject. But my nature, which always impels me to development and systematizing, at last worked its way out also in this instance. For some time I was able to confine myself to extracting only the most important results from the essays, which, to attain clearness and conviction in my own mind, I wrote upon different subjects, to concentrating in that manner their spirit in a small compass. But afterwards my peculiarity gained ascendancy completely. I have developed what I could, and thus naturally have supposed a reader not yet acquainted with the subject. The more I advanced with the work, and the more I yield to the spirit of investigation, so much the more I was also led to system, and thus then, chapter after chapter, has been inserted. My ultimate view has now been to go through the whole once more, to establish by further explanation much of the early treaties, and perhaps to condense into results many analysis on the later ones, and thus to make a moderate whole out of it, forming a small octavo volume. But it was my wish also in this to avoid everything common, everything that is plain of itself that has been said a hundred times and is generally accepted. For my ambition was to write a book that would not be forgotten in two or three years, and which any one interested in the subject would, at all events, take up more than once. In Koblenz, where he was much occupied with duty, he could only give occasional hours to his private studies. It was not until 1818, after his appointment as director of the General Academy of War at Berlin, that he had the leisure to expand his work and enrich it from history of modern wars. This leisure also reconciled him to his new avocation, which, in other respects, was not satisfactory to him, as according to the existing organisation of the Academy, the scientific part of the course is not under the director, but conducted by a board of studies. Free as he was from all petty vanity, from every feeling of restless egotistical ambition, still he felt a desire to be really useful, 
and not to leave inactive the abilities with which God had endowed him. In active life he was not in a position in which this longing could be satisfied, and he had little hope of attaining to any such position. His whole energies were therefore directed upon the domain of science, and the benefit which he hoped to lay the foundation of by his work was the object of his life. That notwithstanding this, the resolution not to let the work appear until after his death became more confirmed is the best proof that no vain, paltry longing for praise and distinction, no particle of egotistical views, was mixed up with this noble aspiration for great and lasting usefulness. Thus he worked diligently on, until in the spring of 1830 he was appointed to the artillery, and his energies were called into activity in such a different sphere, and to such a high degree, that he was obliged, for the moment at least, to give up all literary work. He then put his papers in order, sealed up the separate packets, labelled them, and took sorrowful leave of this employment which he loved so much. He was sent to Breslau in August of the same year, as chief of the second artillery district, but in December recalled to Berlin, and appointed chief of the staff to Field Marshal Count Neissner for the term of his command. In March 1831, he accompanied his revered commander to Posen. When he returned from there to Breslau in November after the melancholy event which had taken place, he hoped to resume his work and perhaps complete it in the course of the winter. The Almighty had willed it should be otherwise. On the 7th November he returned to Breslau. On the 16th he was no more, and the packets sealed by himself were not opened until after his death. The papers thus left are those now made public in the following volumes, exactly in the condition in which they were found, without a word being added or erased. Still, however, there was much to do before publication, in the way of putting them in order and consulting about them, and I am deeply indebted to the several sincere friends for the assistance they have afforded me, particularly Major Oetzel, who kindly undertook the correction of the press, as well as the preparation of maps to accompany the historical parts of the work. I must also mention my much-loved brother, who was my support in the hour of my misfortune, and who has also done much for me in respect of these papers. Amongst other things, by careful examining and putting them in order, he found the commencement of the revision which my dear husband wrote in the year 1827, and mentions in the notice hereafter annexed as a work he had in view. This revision has been inserted in the place intended for it in the first book, for it does not go any further. There are still many other friends to whom I might offer my thanks for their advice, for the sympathy and friendship which they have shown me, but if I do not name them all, they will, I am sure, not have any doubts of my sincere gratitude. It is all the greater for my firm conviction that all they have done was not only on my account, but for the friend whom God has thus called away from them so soon. If I have been highly blessed as the wife of such a man during one and twenty years, so am I still notwithstanding my irreparable loss, by the treasures of my recollections and of my hopes, by the rich legacy of sympathy and friendship which I owe the beloved departed, by the elevating feelings which I experience at seeing his rare worth so generally and honourably acknowledged. The trust confided to me by a royal couple is a fresh benefit for which I have to thank the Almighty, as it opens to me an honourable occupation to which I devote myself, May this occupation be blessed, and may the dear little prince who is now entrusted to my care some day read this book, and be animated by it to deeds like those of his glorious ancestors. Written at the Marble Palace, Potsdam, 30th June, 1832 Marie von Glasowitz, born Countess Bruhl, Oberhofmeisterin to His Royal Highness the Prince William. End of preface. Recording by Linda and Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Notice of On War. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. On War by Karl von Clausewitz. Translated by Colonel J. J. Graham. Notice. I look upon the first six books, of which a fair copy has now been made, as only a mass which is still in a manner without form, and which has yet to again be revised. 
In this revision, the two kinds of war will everywhere be kept more distinctly in view, by which all ideas will acquire a clearer meaning, a more precise direction, and a closer application. The two kinds of war are, first, those in which the object is the overthrow of the enemy, whether it be that we aim at his destruction, politically or merely at disarming him and forcing him to conclude peace on our terms, and next, those in which our object is merely to make some conquests on the frontiers of his country, either for the purpose of retaining them permanently, or of turning them to account as matter for exchange in the settlement of a peace. Transition from one kind to the other must certainly continue to exist, but the completely different nature of the tendencies of the two must everywhere appear, and must separate from each other things which are incompatible. Besides establishing this real difference in wars, another practically necessary point of view must be at the same time established, which is that war is only a continuation of state policy by other means. This point of view being adhered to everywhere will introduce much more unity into the consideration of the subject, and things will be more easily disentangled from each other. Although the chief application of this point of view does not commence until we get to the eighth book, still it must be completely developed in the first book, and also lend assistance through the revision of the first six books. Through such a revision, the first six books will get rid of a good deal of dross. Many rents and chasms will be closed up, and much that is of a general nature will be transformed into distinct conceptions and forms. The seventh book, on attack, for the different chapters which sketches are already made, is to be considered a reflection of the sixth, and must be completed at once according to the above-mentioned more distinct points of view, so that it will require no fresh revision, but rather may serve as a model in the revision of the first six books. For the eighth book, On the Plan of a War, that is, the organisation of a whole war in general, several chapters are designed but they are not at all to be regarded as real materials, they are merely a track roughly cleared, as it were, through the mass, in order, by means to ascertain the points of most importance. They have answered this object, and I propose, on finishing the seventh book, to proceed at once to the working out of the eighth, where the two points of view above mentioned will be chiefly affirmed, by which everything will be simplified, and, at the same time, have a spirit breathed into it. I hope in this book to iron out many creases in the heads of strategists and statesmen, and at least to show the object of action and the real point to be considered in war. Now, when I have brought my ideas clearly out by finishing this eighth book and have properly established the leading features of war, it will be easier for me to carry the spirit of these ideas into the first six books, and to make these same features show themselves everywhere. Therefore, I shall defer till then the revision of the first six books. Should the work be interrupted by my death, then what is found can only be called a mass of conceptions not brought into form. But as these are open to endless misconceptions, they will doubtless give rise to a number of crude criticisms. For in these things, everyone thinks when he takes up his pen that whatever comes into his head is worth saying in printing, and quite as incontrovertible as that twice two make four. If such a one would take the pains, as I have done, to think over the subject for years, and to compare his ideas with military history, he would certainly be a little more guarded in his criticism. Still, notwithstanding this imperfect form, I believe that an impartial reader thirsting for truth and conviction will rightly appreciate in the first six books the fruits of several years' reflection, and a diligent study of war, and that, perhaps, you will find in them some leading ideas, which may bring about a revolution in the theory of war. Berlin, 10th of July, 1827. Besides this notice, among the papers left, the following unfinished memorandum was found, which appears to be of very recent date. The manuscript on the conduct of the Grand Goyer, which will be found after my death, in its present state can only be regarded as a collection of materials from which it is intended to construct a theory of war. With the greater part I am not yet satisfied, and the sixth book is to be looked at as a mere essay. I should have completely remodelled it and have tried a different line. But the ruling principles which pervade these materials I hold to be the right ones. They are the result of a very varied reflection, 
keeping always in view the reality, and always bearing in mind what I have learned by experience and by my intercourse with distinguished soldiers. The seventh book is to contain the attack, the subjects of which are thrown together in a hasty manner. The eighth, the plan for a war, in which I would have examined war more, especially in its political and human aspects. The first chapter of the first book is the only one which I consider as completed. It will at least serve to show the manner in which I propose to treat the subject throughout. The theory of the Grand Guerre, or strategy as it is called, is beset with extraordinary difficulties, and we may affirm that very few men have clear conceptions of the separate subjects, that is, conceptions carried up to their full logical conclusions. In real action most men are guided merely by the tact of judgment, which hits the object more or less accurately, according as they possess more or less genius. This is the way in which all great generals have acted, and therein partly lay their greatness and their genius, that they have always hit upon what was right by this tact. Thus also it will always be in action, and so far this tact is amply sufficient, but when it is a question of not acting oneself, but of convincing others in a consultation, then all depends on clear conceptions and demonstrations of the inherent relations, and so little progress has been made in this respect that most deliberations are merely a contention of words, resting on no firm basis, and ending either in everyone retaining his own opinion, or in a compromise from mutual considerations of respect, a middle course really without any value. Clear ideas on these matters are therefore not wholly useless. Besides, the human mind has a general tendency to clearness and always wants to be consistent with the necessary order of things. Owing to the great difficulties attending a philosophical construction of the art of war, and the many attempts at it that have failed, most people have come to the conclusion that such a theory is impossible, because it concerns things which no standing law can embrace. We should also join in this opinion and give up any attempt at theory, were it not that a great number of propositions make themselves evident without any difficulty, as, for instance, that the defensive form, with the negative object, is the stronger form, the attack, with the positive object, the weaker, that great results carry the little ones with them, that, therefore, strategic effects may be referred to certain centres of gravity, that a demonstration is a weaker application of force than a real attack, that, therefore, there must be some special reason for resorting to the former, that victory consists not merely in the conquest of the field of battle, but in the destruction of armed forces, physically and morally, which can only, in general, be effected by a pursuit after the battle is gained, that successes are always greatest at the point where the victory has been gained, that, therefore, the change from one line and object to another can only be regarded as a necessary evil, that a turning movement is only justified by a superiority of numbers generally, or by the advantage of our lines of communication and retreat over those of the enemy, that flank positions are only justifiable on similar grounds, that every attack becomes weaker as it progresses. End of notice. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. The introduction of the author of On War. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. On War by Karl von Clausewitz. Translated by Colonel J. J. Graham. Introduction of the author. That the conception of the scientific does not consist alone or chiefly in system, and its finished theoretical constructions requires nowadays no exposition. System in this treatise is not to be found on the surface, and instead of a finished building of theory, there are only materials. The scientific form lies here in the endeavour to explore the nature of military phenomena to show their affinity with the nature of the things of which they are composed. Nowhere has the philosophical argument been evaded, but where it runs out into too thin a thread, the author has preferred to cut it short, and fall back upon the corresponding results of experience. For in the same way as many plants only bear fruit when they do not shoot too high, so in the practical arts, the theoretical leaves and flowers 
must not be made to sprout too far, but kept near to experience, which is their proper soil. Unquestionably, it would be a mistake to try and discover from the chemical ingredients of a grain of corn the form of the ear of corn which it bears, as we have only to go to the field to see the ears ripe. Investigation and observation, philosophy and experience, must neither despise nor exclude one another. They mutually afford each other the rights of citizenship. Consequently, the propositions of this book, with their arch of inherent necessity, are supported either by experience or by the conception of war itself as external points, so they are not without abutments. It is perhaps not impossible to write a systematic theory of war full of spirit and substance, but ours hitherto have been very much the reverse, to say nothing of their unscientific spirit in their striving after coherence and completeness of system, they overflow with commonplaces, truisms, and twaddle of every kind. If we want a striking picture of them, we have only to read Lichtenberg's extract from a code of regulations in case of fire. If a house takes fire, we must seek above all things to protect the right side of the house, standing on the left, and, on the other hand, the left side of the house on the right, for if we, for example, should protect the left side of the house on the left, then the right side of the house lies to the right of the left, and consequently, as the fire lies to the right of this side, and of the right side, for we have assumed the house is situated to the left of the fire, therefore the right side is situated nearer to the fire than the left, and the right side of the house might catch fire, if it was not protected before it came to the left, which is protected. Consequently, something might be burnt that is not protected, and that sooner than something else would be burnt, even if it were not protected. Consequently, we must let alone the latter and protect the former. In order to impress the thing on one's mind, we have only to note that if the house is situated to the right of the fire, then it is the left side, and if the house is to the left, it is the right side. In order not to frighten the intelligent reader by such commonplaces and to make the little good that there is distasteful by pouring water upon it, the author has preferred to give in small ingots of fine metal his impressions and convictions, the results of many years' reflection on war, of his intercourse with men of ability, and of much personal experience. Thus the seemingly weakly bound together chapters of this book have arisen, but it is hoped that they will not be found wanting in logical connection. Perhaps soon a greater head may appear, and instead of these single grains, give the whole in a casting of pure metal without dross. End of introduction of the author. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Brief Memoir of General Clausewitz of On War. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. On War by General Karl von Clausewitz. Translated by Colonel J. J. Graham. Brief Memoir of General Clausewitz by Translator. The author of the work here translated, General Karl von Clausewitz, was born at Berg, near Magdeburg, in 1780, and entered the Prussian army as Fahnenjunker, that is, Ensign, in 1792. He served in the campaigns of 1793 and 94 on the Rhine, after which he seems to have devoted some time to the study of the scientific branches of his profession. In 1801 he entered the military school at Berlin and remained there till 1803. During his residence there he attracted the notice of General Scharnhorst, then at the head of the establishment, and the patronage of this distinguished officer had immense influence on his future career, and we may gather from his writings that he ever afterwards continued to entertain a high esteem for Scharnhorst. In the campaign of 1806 he served as aide-de-camp to Prince Augustus of Prussia, and being wounded and taken prisoner, he was sent into France until the close of that war. On his return, he was placed on General Scharnhorst's staff, and employed in the work then going on for the reorganisation of the army. He was also, at this time, selected as a military instructor to the late King of Prussia, then Crown Prince. In 1812, 
Klausowitz, with several other Prussian officers, having entered the Russian service, his first appointment was as aide de camp to General Full. Afterwards, while serving in Wittgenstein's army, he assisted in negotiating the famous convention of Torigen with York. Of the part he took in that affair, he has left an interesting account in his work on the Russian campaign. It is there stated that, in order to bring the correspondence which had been carried on with York to a termination in one way or another, the author was dispatched to York's headquarters with two letters. One was from General Dalvray, the chief of staff of Wittgenstein's army, to General Dybich, showing the arrangements made to cut off York's call from MacDonald. This was necessary in order to give York a plausible excuse for seceding from the French. The other was an intercepted letter from MacDonald to the Duke of Bassano. With regard to the former of these, the author says, It would not have had weight with a man like York. But for a military justification, if the Prussian court should require one as against the French, it was important. The second letter was calculated, at the least, to call up in General York's mind all the feelings of bitterness which had, perhaps for some days past, had been diminished by the consciousness of his own behaviour towards the writer. As the author entered General York's chamber, the latter called out to him, Keep off from me. I will have nothing more to do with you. Your damned Cossacks have let a letter of MacDonald's pass through them, which brings me in order to march to Pipetropoen, in order there to effect our junction. All doubt is now at an end. Your troops do not come up. You are too weak. March I must, and I must excuse myself from further negotiation, which may cost me my head. The author said that he would make no opposition to all this, but begged for a candle, as he had letters to show the general, and, as the latter seemed still to hesitate, the author added, Your Excellency will not, surely, place me in the embarrassment of departing without having executed my commission. The general ordered candles and called in Colonel von Roda, the chief of his staff, from the antechamber. The letters were read. After a pause of an instant, the general said, Klausowitz, you are a Prussian. Do you believe that the letter of General de Alvray is sincere, and that Wittgenstein's troops will really be at the points he mentioned on the 31st? The author replied, I pledge myself for the sincerity of this letter. Upon the knowledge I have of General Dalvray and the other men of Wittgenstein's headquarters, whether the dispositions he announces can be accomplished as he lays down, I... Certainly cannot pledge myself, for your Excellency knows that in war we must often fall short of the line we have drawn for ourselves. The general was silent for a few minutes of earnest reflection. Then he held out his hand to the author and said, You have me. Tell General Dybisch that we must confer early tomorrow at the mill of Poshenin, and that I am now firmly determined to separate myself from the French and their cause. The hour was fixed for 8 a.m., after this was settled, the general added, But I will not do the thing by halves. I will get you Massenbach also. He then called in an officer, who was of Massenbach's cavalry, and who had just left them. Much like Schiller's Wallenstein, he asked, walking up and down the room the while. What say your regiments? The officer broke out with enthusiasm at the idea of a riddance from the French alliance, and said that every man of the troops in question felt the same. You young ones may talk, but my older head is shaking on my shoulders, replied the general. After the close of the Russian campaign, Klausowitz remained in the service of that country, but was attached as a Russian staff officer to Blücher's headquarters till the armistice in 1813. In 1814, he became chief of staff of General Walmoten's Russo-German Corps, which formed part of the Army of the North, under Bernadotte. His name is frequently mentioned with distinction in that campaign, particularly in connection with the affair of Goerd. Klausowitz re-entered the Prussian service in 1815, and served as chief of staff to Thielmann's corps, which was engaged with Grouchy at Wavre on the 18th of June. After the peace, he was employed in a command on the Rhine. In 1818, he became major general and director of the military school, at which he had been previously educated. In 1830, he was appointed inspector of artillery at Breslau, but soon after nominated Chief of the Staff of the Army of Observation under Marshal Nisau on the Polish frontier. The latest notices of his life and services 
are probably to be found in the memoirs of General Brandt, who, from being on the staff of Nassau's army, was brought into daily intercourse with Clausewitz in matters of duty, and also frequently met him at the table of Marshal Nisenau at Posen. Among other anecdotes, General Brandt relates, upon one occasion, the conversation at the Marshal's table turned upon a sermon preached by a priest in which some great absurdities were introduced, and a discussion arose as to whether the bishop should not be made responsible for what the priest had said. This led to the topic of theology in general, when General Brandt, speaking of himself, says, I expressed an opinion that theology is only to be regarded as an historical process, as a moment in the gradual development of the human race. This brought upon me an attack from all quarters, but more especially from Clausewitz, who ought to have been on my side, he having been an adherent and pupil of Kaiserwetter's, who had indoctrinated him in the philosophy of Kant, certainly diluted, I might even say in homeopathic doses. This anecdote is only interesting as the mention of Kaiserwetter points to a circumstance in the life of Clausewitz that may have had an influence in forming those habits of thought which distinguish his writings. The way, says General Brandt, in which General Clausewitz judged things, drew conclusions from movements and marches, calculated the times of the marches, and the points where decisions would take place, was extremely interesting. Fate has unfortunately denied him an opportunity of showing his talents in high command, but I have a firm persuasion that as a strategist he would have greatly distinguished himself. As a leader on the field of battle, on the other hand, he would not have been so much in his right place. From a monk de habitude de commandement, he wanted the art de enlever les troupes. After the Prussian army of observation was dissolved, Klausowitz returned to Breslau and, a few days after his arrival, was seized with cholera, the seeds of which he must have bore with him from the army on the Polish frontier. His death took place in November 1831. His writings are contained in nine volumes, published after his death, but his fame rests most upon the three volumes forming his treatise on war. In the present attempt to render into English this portion of the works of Clausewitz, the translator is sensible of many deficiencies, but he hopes, at all events, to succeed in making this celebrated treatise better known in England, believing, as he does, that so far as the work concerns the interests of this country, it has lost none of the importance it possessed at the time of its first publication. J. J. Graham, Colonel. End of Brief Memoir of General Clausewitz. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Book One, Chapter One of On War. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. On War by Karl von Clausewitz. Translated by Colonel J. J. Graham. Book One On the Nature of War. Chapter One What is War? One Introduction. We propose to consider first the single elements of our subject, then each branch or part, and, last of all, the whole, in all its relations, therefore to advance from the simple to the complex. But it is necessary for us to commence with a glance at the nature of the whole, because it is particularly necessary that in the consideration of any of the parts, their relation to the whole should be kept constantly in view. 2. Definition We shall not enter into the abstruse definitions of war used by publicists. We shall keep to the element of the thing itself, to a duel. War is nothing but a duel on an extensive scale. If we would conceive as a unit the countless number of duels which make up a war, we shall do best by supposing to ourselves two wrestlers, each strives by physical force to compel the other to submit to his will. Each endeavours to throw his adversary, and thus render him incapable of further resistance. War, therefore, is an act of violence intended to compel our opponent to fulfil our will. 
violence arms itself with the inventions of art and science in order to contend against violence. Self-imposed restrictions, almost imperceptible and hardly worth mentioning, termed usages of international law, accompany it without essentially impairing its power. Violence, that is to say, physical force, for there is no moral force without the conception of states and law, is therefore the means. The compulsory submission of the enemy to our will is the ultimate object. In order to obtain this object fully, the enemy must be disarmed, and disarmament becomes therefore the immediate object of hostilities in theory. It takes the place of the final object, and puts it aside as something we can eliminate from our calculations. 3. Utmost Use of Force Now, philanthropists may easily imagine there is a skillful method of disarming and overcoming an enemy without great bloodshed, and that this is the proper tendency of the art of war. However plausible this may appear, still it is an error which must be extirpated, for in such dangerous things as war, the errors which proceed from a spirit of benevolence are the worst. As the use of physical power to the utmost extent by no means excludes the cooperation of the intelligence, it follows that he who uses force unsparingly, without reference to the bloodshed involved, must obtain a superiority if his adversary uses less vigour in its application. The former then dictates the law to the latter, and both proceed to extremities to which the only limitations are those imposed by the amount of the counteracting force on each side. This is the way in which the matter must be viewed, and it is to no purpose, it is even against one's own interest, to turn away from the consideration of the real nature of the affair, because the horror of its elements excites repugnance. If the wars of civilized people are less cruel and destructive than those of savages, the difference arises from the social condition both of the states in themselves and in their relations to each other. Out of this social condition and its relations, war arises, and by it war is subjected to conditions, is controlled and modified, but these things do not belong to war itself. They are only given conditions. And to introduce into the philosophy of war itself a principle of moderation would be an absurdity. Two motives lead men to war, instinctive hostility and hostile intention. In our definition of war, we have chosen as its characteristic the latter of these elements, because it is the most general. It is impossible to conceive the passion of hatred of the wildest description bordering on mere instinct without combining with it the idea of a hostile intention. On the other hand, hostile intentions may often exist without being accompanied by any, or at all events by any extreme, hostility of feeling. Amongst savages, views emanating from the feelings. Amongst civilized nations, those emanating from the understanding have predominance. But this difference arises from the attendant circumstances, existing institutions, and such, and therefore is not to be found necessarily in all cases, although it prevails in the majority. In short, even the most civilized nations may burn with passionate hatred of each other. We may see from this what a fallacy it would be to refer the war of a civilized nation entirely to an intelligent act on the part of the government, and to imagine it as continually freeing itself more and more from all feeling of passion in such a way that, at last, the physical masses of combatants would no longer be required. In reality, their mere relations would suffice, a kind of algebraic action. Theory was beginning to drift in this direction until the facts of the last war taught it better. If war is an active force, it belongs necessarily also to the feelings. It does not originate in the feelings, it reacts 
more or less upon them, and the extent of this reaction depends not on the degree of civilization, but upon the importance and duration of the interests involved. Therefore, if we find civilized nations do not put their prisoners to death, do not devastate towns and countries, this is because their intelligence exercises greater influence on their mode of carrying on war, and has taught them more effectual means of applying force than these rude acts of mere instinct. The invention of gunpowder, the constant progress of improvements in the construction of firearms, are sufficient proofs that the tendency to destroy the adversary, which lies at the bottom of the conception of war, is in no way changed or modified through the progress of civilization. We therefore repeat our proposition that war is an act of violence pushed to its utmost bounds. As one side dictates the law to the other, there arises a sort of reciprocal action which logically must lead to an extreme. This is the first reciprocal action and the first extreme with which we meet. Open bracket, first reciprocal action. Close bracket. Four, the aim is to disarm the enemy. We have already said that the aim of all action in war is to disarm the enemy, and we shall now show that this, theoretically at least, is indispensable. If our opponent is to be made to comply with our will, we must place him in a situation which is more oppressive to him than the sacrifice which we demand. But the disadvantages of this position must naturally not be of a transitionary nature, at least in appearance, otherwise the enemy, instead of yielding, will hold out in the prospect of a change for the better. Every change in this position which is produced by a continuation of the war should, therefore, be a change for the worse. The worst condition in which a belligerent can be placed is that of being completely disarmed. If, therefore, the enemy is to be reduced to submission by an act of war, he must either be positively disarmed or placed in such a position that he is threatened with it. From this it follows that the disarming or overthrow of the enemy, whichever we call it, must always be the aim of warfare. Now war is always the shock of two hostile bodies in collision, not the action of a living power upon an inanimate mass, because an absolute state of endurance would not be making war. Therefore, what we have just said as to the aim of action in war applies to both parties. Here, then, is another case of reciprocal action. As long as the enemy is not defeated, he may defeat me. Then I shall be no longer my own master. He will dictate the law to me, as I did to him. This is the second reciprocal action, and leads to a second extreme. Open bracket, second reciprocal action, close bracket. 5. Utmost exertion of powers. If we desire to defeat the enemy, we must proportion our efforts to his powers of resistance. This is expressed by the product of two factors which cannot be separated, namely the sum of available means and the strength of will. The sum of the available means may be estimated in a measure, as it depends, although not entirely, upon numbers. But the strength of volition is more difficult to determine and can only be estimated to a certain extent by the strength of the motives. Granted we have obtained in this way an approximation of the strength of the power to be contended with, we can then take our own means and either increase them so as to obtain a preponderance, or, in case we have not the resources to effect this, then do our best by increasing our means as far as possible. But the adversary does the same. Therefore, there is a new mutual enhancement which, in pure conception, must create a fresh effort towards an extreme. This is the third case of reciprocal action, and a third extreme with which we meet. Open bracket, third reciprocal action. Close bracket. 6. Modification in the reality. Thus reasoning in the abstract, the mind cannot stop short of an extreme, because it has to deal with an extreme, with a conflict of forces left to themselves and obeying no other but their own inner laws. If we should seek to deduce from the pure conception of war an absolute point for the aim which we shall propose 
and for the means which we shall apply, this constant reciprocal action would involve us in extremes, which would be nothing but a play of ideas produced by an almost invisible train of logical subtleties. If, adhering closely to the absolute, we try to avoid all difficulties by the stroke of the pen, and insist with logical strictness that in every case the extreme must be the object, and the utmost effort must be exerted in that direction, such a stroke of the pen would be a mere paper law, not by any means adapted to the real world. Even supposing this extreme tension of forces was an absolute which could be easily ascertained, still we must admit that the human mind would hardly submit itself to this kind of logical chimera. There would be in many cases an unnecessary waste of power, which would be in opposition to other principles of statecraft. An effort of will would be required, disproportioned to the proposed object, which therefore it would be impossible to realise for the human will does not derive its impulse from logical subtleties, but everything takes a different shape when we pass from abstractions to reality. In the former, everything must be subject to optimism. We must imagine the one side as well as the other, striving after perfection and even attaining it. Will this ever take place in reality? It will if, one, war becomes a completely isolated act which arises suddenly and is in no way connected with the previous history of the combatant states. 2. If it is limited to a single solution, or to several simultaneous solutions. 3. If it contains within itself the solution perfect and complete, free from any reaction upon it, through a calculation beforehand of the political situation which will follow from it. 7. War is never an isolated act. With regard to the first point, Neither of the two opponents is an abstract person to the other, not even as regards that factor in the sum of resistance which does not depend on objective things, that is, the will. This will is not an entirely unknown quantity. It indicates what it will be tomorrow by what it is today. War does not spring up quite suddenly. It does not spread to the full in a moment. Each of the two opponents can, therefore, form an opinion of the other in a great measure, from what he is and what he does, instead of judging him according to what he, strictly speaking, should be or should do. But now, man with his incomplete organisation is always below the line of absolute perfection, and thus these deficiencies, having an influence on both sides, become a modifying principle. 8. War does not consist of a single instantaneous blow. The second point gives rise to the following considerations. If war ended in a single solution or a number of simultaneous ones, then naturally all the preparation for the same would have a tendency to the extreme, for an omission could not in any way be repaired. The utmost, then, that the world of reality could furnish as a guide for us would be the preparations of the enemy, as far as they are known to us. All the rest would fall into the domain of the abstract. But if the result is made up from several successive acts, then naturally that which proceeds with all its phases may be taken as a measure for that which will follow, and in this manner the world of reality again takes the place of the abstract and thus modifies the effort toward the extreme. Yet every war would necessarily resolve itself into a single solution, or a sum of simultaneous results, if all the means required for struggle were raised at once, or could at once be raised, for as one adverse result necessarily diminishes the means, then if all the means had been applied in the first, a second cannot properly be supposed. All hostile acts which might follow would belong essentially to the first, and form, in reality, only its duration. But we have already seen that even in the preparation for war, the real world steps into the place of mere abstract conception, a material standard into the place of the hypotheses of an extreme. That therefore, in that way, both parties, by the influence of the mutual reaction, remain below the line of extreme effort, and therefore all forces are not at once brought forward. It lies also in the nature of these forces and their application that they cannot 
will be brought forward into activity at the same time. These forces are the armies actually on foot, the country with its superficial extent and population, and the allies. In point of fact, the country with its superficial area and population, besides being the source of all military force, constitutes in itself an integral part of the efficient quantities in war, providing either the theatre of war or exercising a considerable influence on the same. Now, it is possible to bring all movable military forces of a country into operation at once, but not all fortresses, rivers, mountains, people, and such. In short, not the whole country, unless it is so small that it may be completely embraced by the first act of the war. Further, the cooperation of allies does not depend on the will of the belligerents, and from the nature of the political relations of states to each other, this cooperation is frequently not afforded until after the war has commenced, or it may be increased to restore the balance of power. That this part of the means of resistance, which cannot at once be brought into activity in many cases, is a much greater part of the whole than might at first be supposed, and that it often restores the balance of power, seriously affected by the great force of the first decision, will be more fully shown hereafter. Here it is sufficient to show that a complete concentration of all available means in a moment of time is contradictory to the nature of war. Now this in itself furnishes no ground for relaxing our effort to accumulate strength to gain the first result, because an unfavourable issue is always a disadvantage to which no one would purposely expose himself, and also because the first decision, although not the only one, still will have more influence on subsequent events, the greater it is in itself. But the possibility of gaining a later result causes men to take refuge in that expectation, owing to the repugnance of the human mind to making excessive efforts. And therefore forces are not concentrated, and measures are not taken for the first decision with that energy which would otherwise be used. Whatever one belligerent emits from weakness becomes to the other a real objective ground for limiting his own efforts, and thus again, through this reciprocal action, extreme tendencies are brought down to efforts on a limited scale. 9. The result in war is never absolute. Lastly, even the final decision of a whole war is not always to be regarded as absolute. The conquered state often sees in it only a passing evil, which may be repaired in after times by means of political combinations. How much this must modify the degree of tension and the vigour of the efforts made is evident in itself. 10. The probabilities of real life take the place of the conceptions of the extreme and the absolute. In this manner, the whole act of war is removed from the rigorous law of forces exerted to the utmost. If the extreme is no longer to be apprehended, and no longer to be sought, it is left to the judgment to determine the limits for the efforts to be made in place of it, and this can only be done on the data furnished by the facts of the real world, by the laws of probability. Once the belligerents are no longer mere conceptions, but individual states and governments, once war is no longer an ideal, but a definite, substantial procedure, then the reality will furnish the data to compute the unknown quantities which are required to be found. From the character, the measures, the situation of the adversary, and the relations with which he is surrounded, each side will draw conclusions by the law of probability as to the designs of the other, and will act accordingly. 11. The political object now reappears. Here the question which we had laid aside forces itself again into consideration. See number two, viz. the political object of the war. The law of the extreme, the view to disarm the adversary, to overthrow him, has hitherto, to a certain extent, usurped the place of this end or object. Just as this law loses its force, the political must again come forward. If the whole consideration is a calculation of probability based on definite persons and relations, then the political object, being the original motive, must be an essential factor in the product. 
The smaller the sacrifice we demand from ours, the smaller, it may be expected, will be the means of resistance which he will employ. But the smaller his preparation, the smaller ours will require to be. Further, the smaller our political object, the less value shall we set upon it, and the more easily shall we be induced to give it up altogether. Thus, therefore, the political object, as the original motive of the war, will be the standard for determining both the aim of the military force and also the amount of effort to be made. This it cannot be in itself, but it is so in relation to both the belligerent states because we are concerned with realities, not with mere abstractions. One and the same political object may produce totally different effects upon different people, or even upon the same people at different times. We can, therefore, only admit the political object as the measure by considering it in its effect upon those masses which it is to move, and, consequently, the nature of those masses also comes into consideration. It is easy to see that this result may be very different according as these masses are animated by a spirit which will infuse vigour into the action or otherwise. It is quite possible for such a state of feeling to exist between two states that a very trifling political motive for war may produce an effect quite disproportionate, in fact, a perfect explosion. This applies to the efforts which the political object will call forth in the two states, and to the aim which the military action shall prescribe for itself. At times it may itself be the aim, as, for example, the conquest of a province. At other times the political object itself is not suitable for the aim of military action then such a one must be chosen as will be equivalent for it, and stand in its place as regards the conclusion of peace. But also in this, due attention to the peculiar character of the states concerned is always supposed. There are circumstances in which the equivalent must be much greater than the political object in order to secure the latter. The political object will be so much the more the standard of aim and effort, and have more influence in itself the more the masses are indifferent, the less that any mutual feeling of hostility prevails in the two states from other causes. And therefore, there are cases where the political object, almost alone, will be decisive. If the aim of the military action is an equivalent for the political object, that action will in general diminish as the political object diminishes, and in a greater degree the more the political object dominates. Thus it is explained how, without any contradiction in itself, there may be wars of all degrees of importance and energy, from a war of extermination down to the mere use of an army of observation. This, however, leads to a question of another kind, which we have hereafter to develop and answer. 12. A suspension in the action of war unexplained by anything said as yet. However insignificant the political claims mutually advanced, however weak the means put forth, however small the aim to which military action is directed, can this action be suspended even for a moment? This is a question which penetrates deeply into the nature of the subject. Every transaction requires for its accomplishment a certain time, which we call its duration. This may be longer or shorter, according as the person acting throws more or less dispatch into his movements. About this, more or less, we shall not trouble ourselves here. Each person acts in his own fashion, but the slow person does not protract the thing because he wishes to spend more time about it, but because, by his nature, he requires more time, and, if he made more haste, would not do the thing so well. This time, therefore, depends on subjective causes, and belongs to the length, so-called, of the action. If we allow now to every action in war this, its length, then we must assume, at first sight at least, that any expenditure of time beyond this length, that is, every suspension of hostile action, appears an absurdity. With respect to this, it must not be forgotten that we now speak not of the progress of one or other, of the two opponents, but of the general progress of the whole action of the war. 13. 
There is only one cause which can suspend the action, and this seems to be only possible on one side in any case. If two parties have armed themselves for strife, then a feeling of animosity must have moved them to it. As long now as they continue armed, that is, do not come to terms of peace, this feeling must exist, and it can only be brought to a standstill by either side by a single motive alone, which is that he waits for a more favourable moment for action. Now, at first sight, it appears that this motive can never exist except on one side, because it, eo ipso, must be prejudicial to the other. If the one has an interest in acting, then the other must have an interest in waiting. A complete equilibrium of forces can never produce a suspension of action, for during this suspension, he who has the most positive object, that is, the assailant, must continue progressing, for if we should imagine an equilibrium in this way, that he who has the positive object, therefore the strongest motive, can at the same time only command the lesser means, so that the equation is made up by the product of the motive and the power, then we must say, if no alteration in this condition of equilibrium is to be expected, the two parties must make peace, but if an alteration is to be expected, then it can only be favourable to one side, and therefore the other has a manifest interest to act without delay. We see that the conception of equilibrium cannot explain a suspension of arms, but that it ends in the question of the expectation of a more favourable moment. Let us suppose, therefore, that one of two states has a positive object as, for instance, the conquest of one of the enemy's provinces, which is to be utilised in the settlement of peace. After this conquest, his political object is accomplished, the necessity for action ceases, and for him a pause ensues. If the adversary is also contented with this solution, he will make peace. If not, he must act. Now, if we suppose that in four weeks he will be in a better condition to act, then he has sufficient grounds for putting off the time of action. But from that moment, the logical course for the enemy appears to be to act that he may not give the conquered party the desired time. Of course, in this mode of reasoning, a complete insight into the state of circumstances on both sides is supposed. 14. Thus a continuance of action will ensure which will advance toward a climax. If this unbroken continuity of hostile operations really existed, the effect would be that everything would again be driven toward the extreme, for, irrespective of the effect of such incessant activity in inflaming the feelings, and infusing into the whole a greater degree of passion, a great elementary force, there would also follow from this continuance of action a stricter continuity, a closer connection between the cause and effect, and thus every single action would become of more importance and, consequently, more replete with danger. But we know that the course of action in war has seldom or never this unbroken continuity, and that there have been many wars in which action occupied by far the smallest portion of time employed, the whole of the rest being spent consumed in inaction. It is impossible that this should be always an anomaly. Suspension of action in war must therefore be possible. That is no contradiction in itself. We now proceed to show how this is. 15. Here, therefore, the principle of polarity is brought into requisition. As we have supposed the interest of one commander to be always antagonistic to those of the other, we have assumed a true polarity. We reserve a fuller explanation of this for another chapter, merely making the following observation on it at present. The principle of polarity is only valid when it can be conceived in one and the same thing where the positive and its opposite the negative completely destroy each other. In a battle, both sides strive to conquer. That is true polarity, for the victory of the one side destroys that of the other. But when we speak of two different things, which have a common relation external to themselves, then it is not the things, but their relations, which have the polarity. 16. Attack and defence are things differing in kind and of unequal force. 
Polarity is therefore not applicable to them. If there was only one form of war, to wit, the attack of the enemy, therefore no defence, or in other words, if the attack was distinguished from the defence merely by the positive motive, which the one has and the other has not, but the methods of each were precisely one and the same, then in this sort of fight every advantage gained on the one side would be a corresponding disadvantage on the other, and true polarity would exist. But action in war is divided into two forms, attack and defence, which, as we shall hereafter explain more particularly, are very different and of unequal strength. Polarity therefore lies in that to which both bear a relation, in the decision, but not in the attack or defence itself. If the one commander wishes the solution put off, the other must hasten to it, but only by the same form of action. If it is A's interest not to attack his enemy at present, but for weeks hence, then it is B's interest to be attacked not for weeks hence, but at the present moment. This is the direct antagonism of interests, but it by no means follows that it would be for B's interest to attack A at once. That is plainly something totally different. 17. The effect of polarity is often destroyed by the superiority of the defence over the attack, and thus the suspension of action in war is explained. If the form of defence is stronger than that of offence, as we shall hereafter show, the question arises, is the advantage of a deferred decision as great on the one side as the advantage of the defensive form on the other? If it is not, then it cannot, by its counterweight, overbalance the latter, and thus influence the progress of the action of the war. We see, therefore, that the impulsive force existing in the polarity of interests may be lost in the difference between the strength of the offensive and the defensive, and thereby become ineffectual. If, therefore, that side for which the present is favourable is too weak to be able to dispense with the advantage of the defensive, he must put up with the unfavourable prospects which the future holds out. For it may still be better to fight a defensive battle in the unpromising future than to assume the offensive or make peace at present. Now, being convinced that the superiority of the defensive, rightly understood, is very great, and much greater than may appear at first sight, we conceive that the greater number of these periods of inaction which occur in a war are thus explained without involving any contradiction. The weaker the motives to action are, the more will those motives be absorbed and neutralised by this difference between the attack and defence, the more frequently, therefore, will action in warfare be stopped, as indeed experience teaches. 18. A second ground consists in the imperfect knowledge of circumstances. But there is still another cause which may stop action in war, viz. an incomplete view of the situation. Each commander can only know fully his own position, that of his opponent can only be known to him by reports which are uncertain. He may, therefore, form a wrong judgment with respect to it upon data of this description, and in consequence of that error he may suppose that the power of taking the initiative rests with his adversary when it lies really with himself. This want of perfect insight might certainly just as often occasion an untimely action as untimely inaction, and hence it would in itself no more contribute to delay than to accelerate action in war. Still, it must always be regarded as one of the natural causes which may bring action in war to a standstill without involving a contradiction. But if we reflect how much more we are inclined and induced to estimate the power of our opponents too high than too low, because it lies in human nature to do so, we shall admit that our imperfect insight into facts in general must contribute very much to delay action in war, and to modify the application of the principles pending our conduct. The possibility of a standstill brings into the action of war a new modification, insomuch as it dilutes the action with the element of time. 
checks the influence or sense of danger in its course and increases the means of reinstating a lost balance of force. The greater of tension of feelings from which the war springs, the greater therefore the energy with which it is carried on. So much the shorter will be the periods of inaction. On the other hand, the weaker the principle of warlike activity, the longer will be these periods, for powerful motives increase the force of the will, and this, as we know, is always a factor in the product of force. 19. Frequent periods of inaction in war remove it further from the absolute and make it still more a calculation of probabilities. But the slower the action proceeds in war, the more frequent and longer the periods of inaction. So much the more easily can an error be repaired. Therefore, so much the bolder a general will be in his calculations. So much more readily will he keep them below the line of the absolute and build everything upon probabilities and conjecture. Thus, according as the course of the war is more or less slow, more or less time will be allowed for that which the nature of a concrete case particularly requires, calculation of probability based on given circumstances. 20. Therefore the element of chance only is wanting to make of war a game, and in that element it is least of all deficient. We see from the foregoing how much the objective nature of war makes it a calculation of probabilities. Now there is only one single element still wanting to make it a game, and that element it certainly is not without. It is chance. There is no human affair which stands so constantly and so generally in close connection with chance as war. But together with chance, the accidental and along with it good luck occupy a great place in war. 21. War is a game both objectively and subjectively. If we now take a look at the subjective nature of war, that is to say, at those conditions under which it is carried on, it will appear to us still more like a game. Primarily the element in which the operations of war are carried on is danger. But which of all the moral qualities is the first in danger? Courage. Now, certainly courage is quite compatible with prudent calculation, but still, they are things of quite a different kind, essentially different qualities of the mind. On the one hand, daring reliance on good fortune, boldness, rashness, are only expressions of courage, and all these propensities of the mind look for the fortuitous, or accidental, because it is their element. We see, therefore, how, from the commencement, the absolute, the mathematical, as it is called, nowhere finds any sure basis in the calculations in the art of war, and that, from the outset, there is a play of possibilities, probabilities, good and bad luck, which spreads about with all the coarse and fine threads of its web, and makes war, of all branches of human activity, the most like a gambling game. 22. How this accords best with the human mind in general. Although our intellect always feels itself urged toward clearness and certainty, still our mind often feels itself attracted by uncertainty. Instead of threading its way with the understanding along the narrow path of philosophical investigations and logical conclusions in order, almost unconscious of itself, to arrive in spaces where it feels itself a stranger and where it seems to part from all well-known objects, it prefers to remain with the imagination in the realms of chance and luck. Instead of living yonder on poor necessity, it revels here in the wealth of possibilities, animated thereby. Courage then takes wings to itself, and daring and danger make the element into which it launches itself, as a fearless swimmer plunges into the stream. Shall theory leave it here, and move on, self-satisfied with absolute conclusions and rules? then it is of no practical use. Theory must also take into account the human element. It must accord a place to courage, to boldness, even to rashness. The art of war has to deal with living and with moral forces, the consequence of which is that it can never attain the absolute and positive. There is therefore everywhere a margin for the accidental, and just as much in the greatest things as in the smallest. As there is room for this accidental on the one hand, 
so on the other there must be courage and self-reliance in proportion to the room available if these qualities are forthcoming in a high degree the margin left may likewise be great courage and self-reliance are therefore principles quite essential to war consequently theory must only set up such rules as to allow ample scope for all degrees and varieties of these necessary and noblest of military virtues in daring there may still be wisdom and prudence as well only they are estimated by a different standard of value 23 war is always a serious means for a serious object its more particular definition such is war such the commander who conducts it such the theory which rules it but war is no pastime no mere passion for venturing and winning no work for a free enthusiasm it is a serious means for a serious object all that appearance which it wears from varying hues of fortune all that it assimilates into itself of the oscillations of passion of courage of imagination of enthusiasm are only particular properties of this means the war of a community of whole nations and particularly of civilized nations always starts from a political condition and is called forth by a political motive it is therefore a political act now if it was a perfect unrestrained and absolute expression of force as we had to deduct from its mere conception then the moment it is called forth by policy it would step into the place of policy and as something quite independent of it would set it aside and only follow its own laws just as a mine at the moment of explosion cannot be guided in any other direction than that which has been given to it by preparatory arrangements this is how the thing has really been viewed hitherto whenever a want of harmony between policy and the conduct of war has led to theoretical distinctions of this kind but it is not so and the idea is radically false war in the real world as we have already seen is not an extreme thing which expends itself at one single discharge it is the operation of powers which do not develop themselves completely in the same manner and in the same measure but which at one time expand sufficiently to overcome the resistance opposed by inertia or friction while at another they are too weak to produce an effect it is therefore in a certain measure a pulsation of violent force more or less vehement consequently making its discharges and exhausting its powers more or less quickly in other words conducting more or less quickly to the aim but always lasting long enough to admit of influence being exerted on its course so as to give it this or that direction in short to be subject to the will of a guiding intelligence if we reflect that war has its root in a political object then naturally this original motive which called it into existence should also continue the first and highest consideration in its conduct still the political object is no despotic lawgiver on that account it must accommodate itself to the nature of the means and though changes in these means may involve modification in the political objective the latter always retains a prior right to consideration policy therefore is interwoven with the whole action of war and must exercise a continuous influence upon it as far as the nature of the forces liberated by it will permit 24 war is a mere continuation of policy by other means we see therefore that war is not merely a political act but a real political instrument a continuation of political commerce a carrying out of the same by other means all beyond this which is strictly peculiar to war relates merely to the peculiar nature of the means which it uses that the tendencies and views of policy shall not be incompatible with these means the art of war in general and the commander in each particular case may demand and this claim is truly not a trifling one but however powerfully this may react on political views in particular cases still it must always be regarded as only a modification of them for the political view is the object war is the means and the means must always include the object in our conception 25 
diversity in the nature of wars. The greater and more powerful the motives of a war, the more it affects the whole existence of a people. The more violent the excitement which precedes the war, by so much the nearer will the war approach to its abstract form, so much more will it be directed to the destruction of the enemy, so much the nearer will the military and political ends coincide, so much the more purely military and less political the war appears to be. But the weaker the motives and the tensions, so much the less will the natural direction of the military element, that is, force, be coincident with the direction which the political element indicates. So much the more must, therefore, the war become diverted from its natural direction, the political object diverge from the aim of an ideal war, and the war appear to become political. But that the reader may not form any false conceptions, we must here observe that by this natural tendency of war, we only mean the philosophical, the strictly logical, and by no means the tendency of forces actually engaged in conflict by which would be supposed to be included all the emotions and the passions of the combatants. No doubt, in some cases, these also might be excited to such a degree as to be with difficulty restrained and confined to the political road. But in most cases, such a contradiction will not arise, because by the existence of such strenuous exertions, a great plan in harmony herewith would be implied. If the plan is directed only upon a small object, then the impulses of feeling among the masses will also be so weak that these masses will require to be stimulated rather than repressed. 26. They may all be regarded as political acts. Returning now to the main subject, although it is true that in one kind of war the political element seems almost to disappear, while in another kind it occupies a very prominent place, we may still affirm that the one is as political as the other. For if we regard the state policy as the intelligence of the personified state, then among all the constellations in the political sky, whose movements it has to compute, those must be included which arise when the nature of its relations imposes the necessity of a great war. It is only if we understand by policy not a true appreciation of affairs in general, but the conventional conception of a cautious, subtle, also dishonest craftiness, averse from violence, that the latter kind of war may belong more to policy than the first. 27. Influence of this view on the right understanding of military history and on the foundations of theory. We see, therefore, in the first place that under all circumstances, war is to be regarded not as an independent thing, but as a political instrument. And it is only by taking this point of view that we can avoid finding ourselves in opposition to all military history. This is the only means of unlocking the great book and making it intelligible. Secondly, this view shows us how wars must differ in character according to the nature of the motives and circumstances from which they proceed. Now, the first, the grandest and most decisive act of judgment which the statesman and general exercises is rightly to understand in this respect the war in which he engages not to take it for something, or to wish to make of it something, which, by the nature of its relations, it is impossible for it to be. This is, therefore, the first, the most comprehensive, of all strategical questions. We shall enter into this more fully in treating of the plan of a war. For the present we content ourselves with having brought the subject up to this point, and having thereby fixed the chief point of view from which war and its theory are to be studied. 28. Result for theory. War is, therefore, not only chameleon-like in character, because it changes its colour in some degree in each particular case, but it is also, as a whole, in relation to the predominant tendencies which are in it, a wonderful trinity, composed of the original violence of its elements, hatred and animosity, which may be looked upon as blind instinct, of the play of probabilities and chance, which make it a free activity of the soul, and of the subordinate nature of a political instrument, by which it belongs purely to reason. The first of these three phases concerns more the people, the second more the general in his army, the third more the government. The passions which break forth in war must already have a latent existence in the peoples.
the range which the display of courage and talent shall get into the realm of probabilities and of chance depends on the particular characteristics of the general and his army, but the political objects belong to the government alone. These three tendencies, which appear like so many different lawgivers, are deeply rooted in the nature of the subject, and at the same time variable in degree. A theory which would leave any one of them out of account, or set up any arbitrary relation between them, would immediately become involved in such a contradiction with reality that it might be regarded as destroyed at once by that alone. The problem is, therefore, that theory shall keep itself poised in a manner between these three tendencies as between three points of attraction. The way in which alone this difficult problem could be solved we shall examine in the book On the Theory of War. In every case, the conception of war as here defined will be the first ray of light which shows us the true foundation of theory and which first separates the great masses and allows us to distinguish them from one another. End of Book 1, Chapter 1 Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia Book 1, Chapter 2 of On War This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson On War by Karl von Clausewitz Translated by Colonel J. J. Graham Book 1, Chapter 2, End and Means in War Having in the foregoing chapter ascertained the complicated and variable nature of war, we shall now occupy ourselves in examining into the influence which this nature has upon the end and means in war. If we ask, first of all, for the object upon which the whole effort of war is to be directed, in order that it may suffice for the attainment of the political object, we shall find that it is just as variable as are the political object and the particular circumstances of the war. If in the next place we keep once more to the pure conception of war, then we must say that the political object probably lies out of its province, for if war is an act of violence to compel the enemy to fulfil our will, then in every case all depends on our overthrowing the enemy, that is, disarming him, and on that alone. This object, developed from abstract conceptions, but which is also the one aimed at in a great many cases in reality, we shall, in the first place, examine in this reality. In connection with the plan of a campaign, we shall hereafter examine more closely into the meaning of disarming a nation, but here we must at once draw a distinction between three things, which, as three general objects, comprise everything else within them. They are the military power, the country, and the will of the enemy. The military power must be destroyed, that is, reduced to such a state as to not be able to prosecute the war. This is the sense in which we wish to be understood hereafter whenever we use the expression destruction of the enemy's military power. The country must be conquered, for out of the country a new military force may be formed. But even when both these things are done, still the war, that is, the hostile feeling and action of hostile agencies, cannot be considered as at an end as long as the will of the enemy is not subdued also. That is, its government and its allies must be forced into signing a peace, or the people into submission. For whilst we are in full occupation of the country, the war may break out afresh, either in the interior, or through assistance given by allies. No doubt, this may also take place after a peace. But that shows nothing more than that every war does not carry in itself the elements for a complete decision and final settlement. But even if this is the case, still with the conclusion of peace a number of sparks are always extinguished which would have smouldered on quietly, and the excitement of the passions abates, because all those whose minds are disposed to peace, of which in all nations and under all circumstances 
there is always a greater number, turn themselves completely away from the road to resistance. Whatever may take place subsequently, we must always look upon the object as attained, and the business of war as ended, by a peace. As protection of the country is the primary object for which the military force exists, therefore the natural order is that, first of all this force should be destroyed, then the country subdued, and through the effects of these two results, as well as the position we then hold, the enemy should be forced to make peace. Generally the destruction of the enemy's force is done by degrees, and in just the same measure the conquest of the country follows immediately. The two likewise usually react upon each other, because the loss of provinces occasions a diminution of military force, but this order is by no means necessary, and on that account it also does not always take place. The enemy's army, before it is sensibly weakened, may retreat to the opposite side of the country, or even quite outside of it. In this case, therefore, the greater part, or the whole of the country, is conquered. But this object of war in the abstract, this final means of attaining the political object in which all others are combined, the disarming the enemy, is rarely attained in practice, and is not a condition necessary to peace, therefore it can in no wise be set up in theory as a law. There are innumerable instances of treaties in which peace has been settled before either party could be looked upon as disarmed, indeed even before the balance of power had undergone any sensible alteration. Nay, further, if we look at the case in the concrete, then we must say that in a whole class of cases, the idea of a complete defeat of the enemy would be a mere imaginative flight, especially when the enemy is considerably superior. The reason why the object deduced from the conception of war is not adapted in general to real war lies in the difference between the two, which is discussed in the preceding chapter. If it was as pure as theory gives it, then a war between two states of very unequal military strength would appear an absurdity, therefore impossible. At most, the inequality between the physical forces might be such that it could be balanced by the moral forces, and that would not go far with our present social condition in Europe. Therefore, if we have seen wars take place between states of very unequal power, that has been the case because there is a wide difference between war and reality and its original conception. There are two considerations which as motives may practically take the place of inability to continue the contest. The first is the improbability, the second is the excessive price of success. According to what we have seen in the foregoing chapter, war must always free itself from the strict law of logical necessity, and seek aid from the calculation of probabilities, and as this is so much more the case, the more the war has a bias that way, from the circumstances out of which it has arisen, the smaller its motives are, and the excitement it has raised, so it is also conceivable how out of this calculation of probabilities, even motives to peace may arise. War does not, therefore, always require to be fought out until one party is overthrown, and we may suppose that, when the motives and passions are slight, a weak probability will suffice to move that side to which it is unfavourable, to give way. Now, were the other side convinced of this beforehand, it is natural that it would strive for this probability only, instead of first wasting time and effort in the attempt to achieve the total destruction of the enemy's army. Still more general in its influence on the resolution to peace is the consideration of the expenditure of force already made and further required. As war is no act of blind passion, but is dominated by the political object, Therefore, the value of that object determines the measure of the sacrifices by which it is to be purchased. This will be the case not only as regards extent, but also as regards duration. As soon, therefore, as the required outlay becomes so great that the political object is no longer equal in value, the object must be given up, and peace will be the result. We see, therefore, that in wars where one side cannot completely disarm the other, the motives to peace on both sides will rise and fall on each side according to the probability of future success and the required outlay. If these motives were equally strong on both sides, 
they would meet in the centre of their political difference. Where they are strong on one side, they might be weak on the other. If their amount is only sufficient, peace will follow, but naturally to the advantage of that side which has the weakest motive for its conclusion. We purposely pass over here the difference, which the positive and negative character of the political end must necessarily produce practically. For although that is, as we shall hereafter show, of the highest importance, still we are obliged to keep here to a more general point of view, because the original political views in the course of the war change very much, and at last may become totally different, just because they are determined by results and probable events. Now comes the question how to influence the probability of success. In the first place, naturally, by the same means which we use when the object is the subjugation of the enemy, by the destruction of his military force and the conquest of his provinces. But these two means are not exactly of the same import here as they would be in reference to that object. If we attack the enemy's army, it is a very different thing whether we intend to follow up the first blow with a succession of others until the whole force is destroyed, or whether we mean to content ourselves with a victory to shake the enemy's feeling of security, to convince him of our superiority, and to instill into him a feeling of apprehension about the future. If this is our object, we only go so far in the destruction of his forces as is sufficient. In like manner, the conquest of the enemy's provinces is quite a different measure if the object is not the destruction of the enemy's army. In the latter case, the destruction of the army is the real effectual action, and the taking of the provinces only a consequence of it. To take them before the army had been defeated would always be looked upon only as a necessary evil. On the other hand, if our views are not directed upon the complete destruction of the enemy's force, and if we are sure that the enemy does not seek, but fears, to bring matters to a bloody decision, the taking possession of a weak or defenceless province is an advantage in itself, and if this advantage is of sufficient importance to make the enemy apprehensive about the general result, then it may also be regarded as a shorter road to peace. But now we come upon a peculiar means of influencing the probability of the result without destroying the enemy's army, namely upon the expeditions which have a direct connection with political views. If there are any enterprises which are particularly likely to break up the enemy's alliances or make them inoperative, to gain new alliances for ourselves, to raise political powers in our own favour, and such, and such, then it is easy to conceive how much these may increase the probability of success and become a shorter way toward our object than the routing of the enemy's forces. The second question is how to act upon the enemy's expenditure in strength, that is, to raise the price of success. The enemy's outlay in strength lies in the wear and tear of his forces, consequentially in the destruction of them on our part, and in the loss of provinces, consequently the conquest of them by us. Here again, on account of the various significations of these means, so likewise it will be found that neither of them will be identical in its signification in all cases if the objects are different. The smallness in general of this difference must not cause us perplexity for for in reality the weakest motives, the finest shades of difference, often decide in favour of this or that method of applying force. Our only business here is to show that, certain conditions being supposed, the possibility of attaining our purpose in different ways is no contradiction, absurdity, nor even error. Besides these two means, there are three other peculiar ways of directly increasing the waste of the enemy's force. The first is invasion, that is, the occupation of the enemy's territory, not with a view to keeping it, but in order to levy contributions upon it, or to devastate it. The immediate object here is neither the conquest of the enemy's territory, nor the defeat of his armed force, but merely to do him damage in a general way. The second way is to select for the object of our enterprises those points at which we can do the enemy most harm. Nothing is easier to conceive than two different directions in which our force may be employed, the first of which is to be preferred if our object is to defeat the enemy's army, while the other is more advantageous if the defeat of the enemy is out of the question. 
According to the usual mode of speaking, we should say that the first is primarily military, the other more political. But if we take our view from the highest point, both are equally military, and neither the one nor the other can be eligible unless it suits the circumstances of the case. The third, by far the most important, from the number of cases which it embraces, is the wearing out of the enemy. We choose this expression not only to explain our meaning in few words, but because it represents the thing exactly, and is not so figurative as it may first appear. The idea of wearing out in a struggle amounts in practice to a gradual exhaustion of the physical powers and of the will by the long continuance of exertion. Now, if we want to overcome the enemy by the duration of the contest, we must content ourselves with as small objects as possible, for it is in the nature of the thing that a great end requires a greater expenditure of force than a small one. But the smallest object that we can propose to ourselves is simple passive resistance, that is, combat without any positive view. In this way, therefore, our means attain their greatest relative value, and therefore the result is best secured. How far now can this negative mode of proceeding be carried? Plainly not to absolute passivity, for mere endurance would not be fighting, and the defensive is an activity by which so much of the enemy's power must be destroyed, that he must give up his object. That alone is what we aim at in each single act, and therein consists the negative nature of our object. No doubt this negative object in its single act is not so effective as the positive object in the same direction would be, supposing it successful. But there is this difference in its favour, that it succeeds more easily than the positive, and therefore it holds out greater certainty of success. What is wanting in the efficacy of its single act must be gained through time, that is, through the duration of the contest, and therefore this negative intention, which constitutes the principle of the pure defensive, is also the natural means of overcoming the enemy by the duration of the combat, that is, of wearing him out. Here lies the origin of that difference of offensive and defensive, the influence of which prevails throughout the whole province of war. We cannot at present pursue the subject further than to observe that from this negative intention are to be deduced all the advantages and all the stronger forms of combat which are on the side of the defensive and in which that philosophical dynamic law which exists between the greatness and the certainty of success is realized. We shall resume the consideration of all this hereafter. If then the negative purpose, that is the concentration of all means into a state of pure resistance, affords a superiority in the contest, and if this advantage is sufficient to balance whatever superiority in numbers the adversary may have, then the mere duration of the contest will suffice gradually to bring the loss of force on the part of the adversary to the point at which the political object can no longer be an equivalent, a point at which, therefore, he must give up the contest. We see, then, that this class of means, the wearing out of the enemy, includes the great number of cases in which the weaker resists the stronger. Frederick the Great, during the Seven Years' War, was never strong enough to overthrow the Austrian monarchy, and if he had tried to do so after the fashion of Charles the Twelfth, he would inevitably have had to succumb himself. But after his skilful application of the system of husbanding his resources had shown the powers allied against him through a seven years' struggle that the actual expenditure of strength far exceeded what they had at first anticipated, they made peace. We see, then, that there are many ways to one's object in war, that the complete subjugation of the enemy is not essential in every case, that the destruction of the enemy's military force, the conquest of the enemy's provinces, the mere occupation of them, the mere invasion of them, enterprises which are aimed directly at political objects, lastly, a passive expectation of the enemy's blow, are all means which, each in itself, may be used to force the enemy's will, according as the peculiar circumstances of the case lead us to expect more from the one or the other. We could still add to these a whole category of shorter methods of gaining the end, which might be called arguments ad hominem. What branch of human affairs is there in which these sparks of individual spirit have not made their appearance, surmounting all formal considerations? And least of all can they fail to appear in war, where the personal character of the combatants plays such an important part both in the cabinet and in the field. 
We limit ourselves to pointing this out, as it would be pedantry to attempt to reduce such influences into classes. Including these, we may say that the number of possible ways of reaching the object rises to infinity. To avoid underestimating these different short roads to one's purpose, either estimating them only as rare exceptions or holding the difference which they cause in the conduct of war as insignificant, we must bear in mind the diversity of political objects which may cause a war, measuring at a glance the distance which there is between a death struggle for political existence and a war which a forced or tottering alliance makes a matter of disagreeable duty. Between the two innumerable gradations occur in practice. If we reject one of these gradations in theory, we might with equal right reject the whole, which would be tantamount to shutting the real world completely out of sight. These are the circumstances in general connected with the aim which we have to pursue in war. Now let us turn to the means. There is only one single means. It is the fight. However diversified this may be in form, however widely it may differ from a rough bent of hatred and animosity in a hand-to-hand -hand encounter, whatever number of things may introduce themselves which are not actual fighting still, it is always implied in the conception of war that all the effects manifested have their roots in the combat. That this must always be so in the greatest diversion and complication of the reality is proved in a very simple manner. All that takes place in war takes place through armed forces, but where the forces of war, that is, armed men, are applied, there the idea of fighting must of necessity be at the foundation. All, therefore, that relates to the forces of war, all that is connected with their creation, maintenance, and application, belongs to military activity. Creation and maintenance are obviously only the means, whilst application is the object. The contest of war is not a contest of individual against individual, but an organized whole, consisting of manifold parts. In this great whole, we may distinguish units of two kinds, the one determined by the subject, the other by the object. In an army, the mass of combatants ranges itself always into an order of new units, which again form members of a higher order. The combat of each of these members forms, therefore, also a more or less distinct unit. Further, the motive of the fight, therefore its object, forms the unit. Now to each of these units, which we distinguish in the contest, we attach the name of combat. If the idea of combat lies at the foundation of every application of armed power, then also the application of armed force in general is nothing more than the determining and arranging a certain number of combats. Every activity in war, therefore, necessarily relates to the combat either directly or indirectly. The soldier is levied, clothed, armed, exercised, he sleeps, eats, drinks and marches, all merely to fight at the right time and place. If, therefore, all the threads of military activity terminate in the combat, we shall grasp them all when we settle the order of the combats. Only from this order and its execution proceed the effects, never directly from the conditions preceding them. Now, in the combat, all the action is directed to the destruction of the enemy, or rather, of his fighting powers, for this lies in the conception of combat, the destruction of the enemy's fighting power is, therefore, always the means to attain the object of the combat. This object may likewise be the mere destruction of the enemy's armed force, but that is not by any means necessary, and it may be something quite different. Whenever, for instance, as we have shown, the defeat of the enemy is not the only means to attain the political object, whenever there are other objects which may be pursued as the aim in a war, that it follows of itself that such other objects may become the object of particular acts of warfare, and therefore also the object of combats. But even those combats which as subordinate acts are in the strict sense devoted to the destruction of the enemy's fighting force, need not have that destruction itself as their first object. If we think of the manifold parts of a great armed force, of the number of circumstances which come into activity when it is employed, then it is clear that the combat of such force, 
must also require a manifold organisation, a subordinating of parts and formation. There may and must naturally arise from particular parts a number of objects which are not themselves the destruction of the enemy's armed force, and which, while they certainly contribute to increase that destruction, do so only in an indirect manner. If a battalion is ordered to drive the enemy from rising ground or a bridge and such, then, properly, the occupation of any such locality is the real object. The destruction of the enemy's armed force, which takes place only the means or secondary matter. If the enemy can be driven away merely by a demonstration, the object is attained all the same. But this hill or bridge is, in point of fact, only required as a means of increasing the gross amount of loss inflicted on the enemy's armed force. It is the case on the field of battle, much more must it be so on the whole theatre of war, when not only one army is opposed to another, but one state, one nation, one whole country to another. Here, the number of possible relations and, consequently, possible combinations is much greater. The diversity of measures increased, and by the gradation of objects, each subordinate to another, the first means employed is further apart from the ultimate object. It is therefore for many reasons possible that the object of a combat is not the destruction of the enemy's force, that is, of the force immediately opposed to us, but that this only appears as a means. But in all such cases it is no longer a question of complete destruction, for the combat is here nothing else but a measure of strength, has in itself no value except that of the present result, that is, of its decision. But a measuring of strength may be effected in cases where the opposing sides are very unequal, by a mere comparative estimate. In such cases no fighting will take place, and the weaker will immediately give way. If the object of the combat is not always the destruction of the enemy's force therein engaged, and if its object can often be attained as well without the combat taking place at all, by merely making a resolve to fight, and by the circumstances to which the resolution gives rise, then that explains how a whole campaign may be carried on with great activity without the actual combat playing any notable part in it. That this may be so, military history proves by a hundred examples. How many of those cases can be justified that is, without involving a contradiction, and whether some of the celebrities who rose out of them would stand criticism, we shall leave undecided. For all we have to do with the matter is to show the possibility of such a course of events in war. We have only one means in war, the battle. But this means, by the infinite variety of paths in which it may be applied, leads us into all the different ways which the multiplicity of objects allows of, so that we seem to have gained nothing, but that is not the case, for from this unity of means proceeds a thread which assists the study of the subject as it runs through the whole web of military activity and holds it together. But we have considered the destruction of the enemy's force as one of the objects which may be pursued in war, and left undecided what relative importance should be given to it amongst other objects. In certain cases it will depend on circumstances, and as a general question we have left its value undetermined. We are once more brought back upon it, and we shall be able to get an insight into the value which must necessarily be accorded to it. The combat is the single activity in war. In the combat the destruction of the enemy opposed to us is the means to the end. It is so even when the combat does not actually take place, because in that case there lies at the root of the decision, the supposition, at all events, that this destruction is to be regarded as beyond doubt. It follows, therefore, that the destruction of the enemy's military force is the foundation stone of all action in war. The great support of all combinations, which rest upon it, like the arch on its abutments. All action, therefore, takes place on the supposition that if the solution by force of arms which lies at its foundation should be realized, it will be a favorable one. The decision by arms is, for all operations in a war, great and small, what cash payment is in bill transactions. However remote from each other these relations, however seldom the realization may take place, 
still it can never entirely fail to occur. If the decision by arms lies at the foundation of all combinations, then it follows that the enemy can defeat each of them by gaining a victory on the field, not merely in the one on which our combination directly depends, but also in any other encounter if it is only important enough. For every important decision by arms, that is, destruction of the enemy's forces, reacts upon all preceding it because, like a liquid element, they tend to bring themselves to a level. Thus the destruction of the enemy's armed force appears, therefore, always as the superior and more effectual means to which all others must give way. It is, however, only when there is a supposed equality in all other conditions that we can ascribe to the destruction of the enemy's armed force the greater efficacy. It would, therefore, be a great mistake to draw the conclusion that a blind dash must always gain the victory over skill and caution. An unskillful attack would lead to the destruction of our own and not the enemy's force, and therefore is not what is here meant. The superior efficacy belongs not to the means, but to the end, and we are only comparing the effect of one realized purpose with the other. If we speak of the destruction of the enemy's armed force, we must expressly point out that nothing obliges us to confine this idea to the mere physical force. On the contrary, the moral is necessarily implied as well, because both in fact are interwoven with each other, even in the most minute details, and therefore cannot be separated. But it is just in connection with the inevitable effect which has been referred to, of a great act of destruction, a great victory, upon all other decisions by arms, that this moral element is most fluid, if we may use that expression, and therefore distributes itself the most easily through all the parts. Against the far superior worth, which the destruction of the enemy's force has over all other means, stands the expense and risk of this means, and it is only to avoid these that any other means are taken. That these must be costly stands to reason, for the waste of our own military forces must, ceteris paribus, always be greater the more our aim is directed upon the destruction of the enemy's power. The danger lies in this, that the greater efficacy which we seek recoils on ourselves, and therefore has worse consequences in case we fail of success. Other methods are therefore less costly when they succeed, less dangerous when they fail, but in this is necessarily lodged the condition that they are only opposed to similar ones, that is, that the enemy acts on the same principle. For if the enemy should choose the way of a great decision by arms, our means must on that account be changed against our will in order to correspond with his. Then all depends on the issue of the act of destruction, but of course it is evident that Cetus Paribus in this act we must be at a disadvantage in all respects, because our views and our means had been directed in part upon other objects, which is not the case with the enemy. Two different objects, of which one is not part, the other exclude each other, and therefore a force which may be applicable for the one may not serve for the other. If, therefore, one of two belligerents is determined to seek the great decision by arms, then he has a high probability of success, as soon as he is certain that his opponent will not take that way, but follows a different object. And every one who sets before himself any such other aim only does so in a reasonable manner, provided he acts on the supposition that his adversary has as little intention as he has of resorting to the great decision by arms. But what we have here said of another direction of views and forces relates only to other positive objects, which we may propose to ourselves in war, besides the destruction of the enemy's force, not by any means to the pure defensive, which may be adopted with a view thereby to exhaust the enemy's forces. In the pure defensive, the positive object is wanting, and therefore, while on the defensive, our forces cannot at the same time be directed on other objects. They can only be employed to defeat the intentions of the enemy. We have now to consider the opposite of the destruction of the enemy's armed force, that is to say, the preservation of our own. These two efforts always go together as they mutually act and react on each other. They are integral parts of one and the same view, 
and we have only to ascertain what effect is produced when one or the other has the predominance. The endeavour to destroy the enemy's force has a positive object and leads to positive results, of which the final aim is the conquest of the enemy. The preservation of our own forces has a negative object, leads therefore to the defeat of the enemy's intentions, that is, to pure resistance, of which the final aim can mean nothing more than to prolong the duration of the contest, so that the enemy shall exhaust himself in it. The effort with a positive object calls into existence the act of destruction. The effort with the negative object awaits it. How far this state of expectation should and may be carried, we shall enter into more particularly in the theory of attack and defence, at the origin of which we again find ourselves. Here we shall content ourselves with saying that the awaiting must be no absolute endurance, and that in the action bound up with it, the destruction of the enemy's armed force engaged in this conflict may be the aim just as well as anything else. It would therefore be a great error in the fundamental idea to suppose that the consequence of the negative course is that we are precluded from choosing the destruction of the enemy's military force as our object and must prefer a bloodless solution. The advantage which the negative effort gives may certainly lead to that, but only at the risk of its not being the most advisable method as the question is dependent on totally different conditions, resting not with ourselves, but with our opponents. This other bloodless way cannot, therefore, be looked upon at all as the natural means of satisfying our great anxiety to spare our forces. On the contrary, when circumstances are not favourable, it would be the means of completely ruining them. Very many generals have fallen into this error and been ruined by it. The only necessary effect resulting from the superiority of the negative effort is the delay of the decision, so that the party acting takes refuge in that way, as it were, in the expectation of the decisive moment. The consequence of that is generally the postponement of the action as much as possible in time, and also in space, insofar as space is in connection with it. If the moment has arrived in which this can no longer be done without ruinous disadvantage, then the advantage of the negative must be considered as exhausted, and then comes forward unchanged the effort for the destruction of the enemy's force, which was kept back by a counterpoise, but never discarded. We have seen, therefore, in the foregoing reflections, that there are many ways to the aim, that is, to the attainment of the political object, but that the only means is the combat, and that, consequently, everything is subject to a supreme law, which is the decision by arms that where this is really demanded by one, it is a redress which cannot be refused by the other, that therefore a belligerent who takes any other way must make sure that his opponent will not take this means of redress, or his cause may be lost in that supreme court. Hence, therefore, the destruction of the enemy's armed force, amongst all the objects which can be pursued in war, appears always as the one which overrules all others. What may be achieved by combinations of another kind in war, we shall only learn in the sequel, and naturally only by degrees. We content ourselves here with acknowledging in general their possibility as something pointing to the difference between reality and the conception, and to the influence of particular circumstances. But we could not avoid showing at once that the bloody solution of the crisis, the effort for the destruction of the enemy's force, is the first-born son of war. If, when political objects are unimportant, motives weak, the excitement of forces small, a cautious commander tries, in all kinds of ways, without great crises and bloody solutions, to twist himself skillfully into a peace through the characteristic weaknesses of his enemy in the field and in the cabinet, we have no right to find fault with him. If the premises on which he acts are well-founded, and justified by success. Still, we must require him to remember that he only travels on forbidden tracks, where the god of war may surprise him, that he ought always to keep his eye on the enemy, in order that he may not have to defend himself with a dress rapier, if the enemy takes up a sharp sword. The consequences of the nature of war, how ends and means act in it, how in the modifications of reality it deviates sometimes more, sometimes less, from its strict conception, fluctuating backwards and forwards, yet always remaining under that strict conception as under a supreme law, 
All this we must retain before us and bear constantly in mind in the consideration of each of the succeeding subjects, if we would rightly comprehend their true relations and proper importance and not become involved incessantly in the most glaring contradictions with the reality, and at last with our own selves. End of Book 1, Chapter 2 Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Book 1, Chapter 3 of On War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Ferguson On War by Karl von Clausewitz Translated by Colonel J. J. Graham Book 1, Chapter 3 The Genius for War Every special calling in life, if it is to be followed with success, requires peculiar qualifications of understanding and soul. Where these are of high order and manifest themselves by extraordinary achievements, the mind to which they belong is termed genius. We know very well that this word is used in many significations which are very different both in extent and nature, and that with many of these significations it is a very difficult task to define the essence of genius. But as we neither profess to be philosopher nor grammarian, we must be allowed to keep to the meaning usual in ordinary language, and to understand by genius a very high mental capacity for certain employments. We wish to stop for a moment over this faculty and dignity of the mind, in order to vindicate its title and to explain more fully the meaning of the conception. But we shall not dwell on that, genius, which has obtained its title through a very great talent, on genius properly so called. That is a conception which has no defined limits. What we have to do is bring under consideration every common tendency of the powers of the mind and soul towards the business of war, the whole of which common tendencies we may look upon as the essence of military genius. We say common for just therein consists military genius. That is not one single quality bearing upon war as, for instance, courage, while other qualities of the mind and soul are wanting or have a direction which is unserviceable for war, but that it is an harmonious association of powers in which one or other may predominate, but none must be in opposition. If every combatant required to be more or less endowed with military genius, then our armies would be very weak, for it implies a peculiar bent of intelligent powers, therefore it can only rarely be found where the mental powers of a people are called into requisition and trained in many different ways. The fewer the employments followed by a nation, the more that of arms predominates, so much the more prevalent will military genius also be found. But this merely applies to its prevalence, by no means to its degree, for that depends on the general state of intellectual culture in the country. If we look at a wild warlike race, then we find a warlike spirit in individuals, much more common than in a civilized people for in the former almost every warrior possesses it, whilst in the civilized whole masses are only carried away by it from necessity, never by inclination. But among uncivilized people we never find a really great general, and very seldom what we can properly call a military genius, because that requires a development of the intelligent powers which cannot be found in an uncivilized state. That a civilized people may also have a warlike tendency and development is a matter of course, and the more this is general, the more frequently also will military spirit be found in individuals in their armies. Now as this coincides in such case with the high degree of civilization, therefore from such nations have issued forth the most brilliant military exploits, as the Romans and French have exemplified. The greatest names in these and in all other nations that have been renowned in war belong strictly to epochs of higher culture. From this we may infer how great a share the intelligent powers have in a superior military genius. We shall now look more closely into this point. 
War is the province of danger, and therefore courage above all things is the first quality of a warrior. Courage is of two kinds, the first physical courage, or courage in the presence of danger to the person, and next moral courage, or courage before responsibility, whether it be before the judgment seat of external authority, or of the inner power, the conscience. We only speak here of the first. Courage before danger to the person, again, is of two kinds. First, it may be indifference to danger, whether proceeding from the organism of the individual, contempt of death or habit. In any of these cases, it is to be regarded as a permanent condition. Secondly, courage may proceed from positive motives, such as personal pride, patriotism, enthusiasm of any kind. In this case, courage is not so much a normal condition as an impulse. We may conceive that the two kinds act differently. The first kind is more certain, because it has become a second nature, never forsakes the man. The second often leads him farther. In the first, there is more of firmness, in the second, of boldness. The first leaves the judgment cooler, the second raises its power at times, but often bewilders it. The two combined make up the most perfect kind of courage. War is the province of physical exertion and suffering. In order not to be completely overcome by them, a certain strength of body and mind is required, which, either natural or acquired, produces indifference to them. With these qualifications, under the guidance of simply a sound understanding, a man is at once a proper instrument for war. And these are the qualifications so generally to be met with amongst wild and half-civilized tribes. If we go further into the demands which war makes on it, then we find the powers of the understanding predominating. War is the province of uncertainty. Three-fourths of those things upon which action in war must be calculated are hidden more or less in the clouds of great uncertainty. Here then, above all, a fine and penetrating mind is called for to search out the truth by the tact of its judgment. An average intellect may, at one time, perhaps hit upon this truth by accident, and extraordinary courage at another may compensate for the want of this tact, but in the majority of cases, the average result will always bring to light the deficient understanding. War is the province of chance. In no human sphere of activity is such a margin to be left for this intruder, because none is so much in constant contact with him on all sides. He increases the uncertainty of every circumstance and deranges the course of events. From this uncertainty of all intelligence and suppositions, this continual interposition of chance, the actor in war constantly finds things different from his expectations, and this cannot fail to have an influence on his plans, or at least on the presumptions connected with these plans. If this influence is so great as to render the predetermined plan completely nugatory, then, as a rule, a new one must be substituted in its place. But, at the moment, the necessary data are often wanting for this, because in the course of action circumstances press for immediate decision, and allow no time to look about for fresh data, often not enough for mature consideration. But it more often happens that the correction of one premise, and the knowledge of chance events which have arisen, are not sufficient to overthrow our plans completely, but only suffice to produce hesitation. Our knowledge of circumstances has increased, but our uncertainty, instead of having been diminished, has only increased. The reason of this, that we do not gain all our experience at once, but by degrees, Thus our determinations continue to be assailed incessantly by fresh experience, and the mind, if we may use that expression, must always be under arms. Now, if it is to get safely through this perpetual conflict with the unexpected, two qualities are indispensable. In the first place, an intellect which, even in the midst of this intense obscurity, is not without some traces of inner light, which lead to the truth, and then the courage to follow this light. The first is figuratively expressed by the French phrase coup de oeil. The other is resolution. As battle is the feature in war to which attention was originally chiefly directed, and as time and space are important elements in it, more particularly when cavalry with their rapid decisions were the chief arm, the idea of rapid and correct decision related in the first instance to the estimation of these two elements and to denote the idea an expression was adopted which actually only points to a correct judgment by eye. Many teachers of the art of war then gave this limited signification as the definition of coup de oeil. But it is undeniable that all able decisions formed in the moment of action 
soon came to be understood by the expression, as, for instance, the hitting upon the right point of attack, and such. It is, therefore, not only the physical, but more frequently, the mental eye, which is meant by coup d'oeil. Naturally, the expression, like the thing, is always more in its place in the field of tactics. Still, it must not be wanting in strategy, insomuch as in it rapid decisions are often necessary. If we strip this conception of that which the expression has given it of the over-figurative and restricted, then it amounts simply to the rapid discovery of a truth, which to the ordinary mind is either not visible at all, or only becomes so after long examination and reflection. Resolution is an act of courage in single instances, and if it becomes a characteristic trait, it is a habit of the mind. But here we do not mean courage in face of bodily danger, but in face of responsibility therefore to a certain extent against moral danger. This has often been called courage d'esprit on the ground that it springs from the understanding. Nevertheless, it is no act of the understanding on that account. It is an act of feeling. Mere intelligence is still not courage, for we often see the cleverest people devoid of resolution. The mind must, therefore, first awaken the feeling of courage and then be guided and supported by it, because in momentary emergencies, the man is swayed more by his feelings than his thoughts. We have assigned to resolution the office of removing the torments of doubt and the dangers of delay when there are no sufficient motives for guidance. Through the unscrupulous use of language which is prevalent, this term is often applied to the mere propensity to daring, to bravery, boldness, or temerity, but when there are sufficient motives in the man, let them be objective or subjective, true or false, we have no right to speak of his resolution, for when we do so, we put ourselves in his place, and we throw into the scale doubts which did not exist with him. Here there is no question of anything but strength and weakness. We are not pedantic enough to dispute with the use of language about this little misapplication. Our observation is only intended to remove wrong objections. This resolution now, which overcomes the state of doubting, can only be called forth by the intellect and, in fact, by a peculiar tendency of the same. We maintain that the mere union of a superior understanding and the necessary feelings are not sufficient to make up resolution. There are persons who possess the keenest perception for the most difficult problems, who are also not fearful of responsibility, and yet, in cases of difficulty, cannot come to a resolution. Their courage and their sagacity operate independently of each other, do not give each other a hand, and on that account do not produce resolution as a result. The forerunner of resolution is an act of the mind making evident the necessity of venturing, and thus influencing the will. This quite peculiar direction of the mind, which conquers every other fear in man by the fear of wavering or doubting, is what makes up resolution in strong minds. Therefore, in our opinion, men who have little intelligence can never be resolute. They may act without hesitation under perplexing circumstances, but then they act without reflection. Now, of course, when a man acts without reflection, he cannot be at variance with himself by doubts, and such a mode of action may, now and then, lead to the right point. But we say now, as before, it is the average result which indicates the existence of military genius. Should our assertion appear extraordinary to anyone, because he knows many a resolute hussar officer, who is no deep thinker, we must remind him that the question here is about a peculiar direction of the mind, and not about great thinking powers. We believe, therefore, that resolution is indebted to a special direction of the mind for its existence, a direction which belongs to a strong head rather than a brilliant one. In corroboration of this genealogy of resolution, we may add that there have been many instances of men who have shown the greatest resolution in an inferior rank and have lost it in a higher position. While, on the one hand, they are obliged to resolve, on the other, they see the dangers of a wrong decision, and as they are surrounded with things new to them, their understanding loses its original force, and they become only the more timid, the more they become aware of the danger, of the irresolution into which they have fallen, and the more they have formerly been in the habit of acting on the spur of the moment. From the coup d'oeil and resolution, we naturally speak of its kindred quality, presence of mind, which in a region of the unexpected, like war, must act a great part, for it is indeed nothing but a great conquest over the unexpected. As we admire presence of mind in a pithy answer to anything said unexpectedly, so we admire it in a ready expedient on sudden danger. Neither the answer nor the expedient deed be in themselves extraordinary, if they only hit the point. 
For that which, as a result of mature reflection, would be nothing unusual, therefore insignificant in its impression on us, may, as an instantaneous act of the mind, produce a pleasing impression. The expression presence of mind certainly donates very fitly the readiness and rapidity of the help rendered by the mind. Whether this noble quality of a man is to be ascribed more to the peculiarity of his mind, or the equanimity of his feelings, depends on the nature of the case, although neither of the two can be entirely wanting. A telling repartee bespeaks rather a ready wit. A ready expedient on sudden danger implies more particularly a well-balanced mind. If we take a general view of the four elements comprising the atmosphere in which war moves, of danger, physical effort, uncertainty, and chance, it is easy to conceive that a great force of mind and understanding is requisite to be able to make way with safety and success among such opposing elements, a force which, according to the different modifications arising out of circumstances, we find termed by military writers and analysts as energy, firmness, staunchness, strength of mind, and character. All these modifications of the heroic nature might be regarded as one and the same power of volition, modified it according to circumstances. But nearly related as these things are to each other, still they are not one and the same, and it is desirable for us to distinguish here, a little more closely, at least, the action of the powers of the soul in relation to them. In the first place, to make the conception clear, it is essential to observe that the weight, burden, resistance, or whatever it may be called, by which the force of the soul in the general is brought to light, is only in a very small measure the enemy's activity, the enemy's resistance the enemy's action directly. The enemy's activity only affects the general directly in the first place in relation to his person, without disturbing his action as commander. If the enemy, instead of two hours, resists for four, the commander, instead of two hours, is four hours in danger. This is a quality which plainly diminishes the higher the rank of the commander. What is it for one in the post of commander-in-chief? It is nothing. Secondly, although the opposition offered by the enemy has a direct effect on the commander, through the loss of means arising from prolonged resistance, and the responsibility connected with that loss, and his force of will is first tested and called forth by these anxious considerations, still, we maintain, this is not the heaviest burden by far which he has to bear, because he has only himself to settle with. All the other effects of the enemy's resistance act directly upon the combatants under his command, and through them, react upon him. As long as his men, full of good courage, fight with zeal and spirit, it is seldom necessary for the chief to show great energy of purpose in the pursuit of his object. But as soon as difficulties arise, and that must always happen when great results are at stake, then things no longer move on of themselves like a well-oiled machine. The machine itself begins to offer resistance, and to overcome this, the commander must have a great force of will. By this resistance we must not exactly suppose disobedience in murmurs, although these are frequent enough with particular individuals. It is the whole feeling of the dissolution of all physical and moral power. It is the heart-rending sight of the bloody sacrifice which the commander has to contend with in himself, and then in all others who directly or indirectly transfer to him their impressions, feelings, anxieties and desires. As the force in one individual after another becomes prostrated and can no longer be excited and supported by an effort of his own will, the whole inertia of the mass gradually rests its weight on the will of the commander. By the spark in his breast, by the light of his spirit, the spark of purpose, the light of hope, must be kindled afresh in others. In so far only as he is equal to this, he stands above the masses and continues to be their master. Whenever that influence ceases, and his own spirit is no longer strong enough to revive the spirit of all others, the masses, drawing him down with them, sink into the lower region of animal nature, which shrieks from danger and knows no shame. These are the weights which the courage and intelligent faculties of the military commander have to overcome if he is to make his name illustrious. They increase with the masses, and therefore, if the forces in question are to continue equal to the burden, they must rise in proportion to the height of the station. Energy in action expresses the strength of the motive through which the action is excited. Let the motive have its origin in a conviction of the understanding, or in an impulse, but the latter can hardly ever be wanting, where great force is to show itself. Of all the noble feelings which fill the human heart in the exciting tumult of battle, 
None, we must admit, are so powerful and constant as the soul's thirst for honour and renown, which the German language treats so unfairly and tends to deprecate by the unworthy associations in the word Ehrgeiz, greed of honour, and Rumsucht, hankering after glory. No doubt it is just in war that the abuse of these proud aspirations of the soul must bring upon the human race the most shocking outrages, but by their origin they are certainly to be counted amongst the noblest feelings which belong to human nature, and in war they are the vivifying principle which gives the enormous body a spirit. Although other feelings may be more general in their influence, and many of them, such as love of country, fanaticism, revenge, enthusiasm of every kind, may seem to stand higher, the thirst for honour and renown still remains indispensable. Those other feelings may rouse the great masses in general and excite them more powerfully, but they do not give the leader a desire to will more than others, which is an essential requisite in his position if he is to make himself distinguished in it. They do not, like the thirst for honour, make the military act, specially the property of the leader, which he strives to turn to the best account, where he ploughs with toil, sows with care, that he may reap plentifully. It is through these aspirations we have been speaking of in commanders, from the highest to the lowest, this sort of energy, this spirit of emulation, these incentives, that the action of armies is chiefly animated and made successful. And now, as that which specially concerns the head of all, we ask, has there ever been a great commander destitute of the love of honour, or is such a character even conceivable? Firmness denotes the resistance of the will in relation to the force of a single blow. Staunchness in relation to a continuance of blows. Close as is the analogy between the two, and often as the one is used in place of the other, still there is a notable difference between them which cannot be mistaken, insomuch as firmness against a single powerful impression may have its root in the mere strength of a feeling, but staunchness must be supported rather by the understanding. For the greater duration of an action, the more systemic deliberation is connected with it, and from this, staunchness partially derives its power. If we now turn to strength of mind, or soul, then the first question is, what are we to understand thereby? Plainly, it is not vehement expressions of feeling, nor easily excited passions, for that would be contrary to all usage of language, but the power of listening to reason in the midst of the most intense excitement in the storm of the most violent passions. Should this power depend on the strength of understanding alone? We doubt it. The fact that there are men of the greatest intellect who cannot command themselves certainly proves nothing to the contrary, for we might say that it perhaps requires an understanding of a powerful rather than a comprehensive nature, but we believe we shall be nearer the truth if we assume that the power of submitting oneself to the control of the understanding, even in moments of the most violent excitement of the feelings, that power which we call self-command, has its root in the heart itself. It is, in point of fact, another feeling, which in strong minds balances the excited passions without destroying them. And it is only through this equilibrium that mastery of the understanding is secured. This counterpoise is nothing but a sense of the dignity of man, that noblest pride, that deep-seated desire of the soul, always to act as a being endued with understanding and reason. We may therefore say that a strong mind is one which does not lose its balance, even under the most violent excitement. If we cast a glance at the variety to be observed in the human character in respect to feeling, we find, first, some people who have very little excitability, who are called phlegmatic or indolent, Second, some very excitable, but whose feelings still never overstep certain limits, and who are therefore known as men full of feeling, but sober-minded. Thirdly, there are those very easily roused, whose feelings blaze up quickly and violently like gunpowder, but do not last. Fourthly, and lastly, those who cannot be moved by slight causes, and who generally are not to be roused suddenly, but only gradually, but whose feelings become very powerful and are much more lasting. These are men with strong passions, lying deep and latent. This difference of character lies probably close on the confines of the physical powers which move the human organism, and belongs to the amphibious organisation which we call the nervous system, which appears to be partly material, partly spiritual. With our weak philosophy we shall not proceed further in this mysterious field, but it is important for us to spend a moment over the effects which these different natures have on action in war, 
and to see how far a great strength of mind is to be expected from them. Indolent men cannot easily be thrown out of their equanimity, but we cannot certainly say there is strength of mind where there is a want of all manifestation of power. At the same time, it is not to be denied that such men have a certain peculiar aptitude for war on account of their constant equanimity. They often want the positive motive to action, impulse, and consequential activity, but they are not apt to throw things into disorder. The peculiarity of the second class is that they are easily excited to act on trifling grounds, but in great matters they are easily overwhelmed. Men of this kind show great activity in helping an unfortunate individual, but by the distress of a whole nation they are only inclined to despond, not roused to action. Such people are not deficient in either activity or equanimity in war, but they will never accomplish anything great unless a great intellectual force furnishes the motive, and it is very seldom that a strong, independent mind is combined with such a character. Excitable, inflammable feelings are in themselves very little suited for practical life, and therefore they are not very fit for war. They have certainly the advantage of strong impulses, but they cannot sustain them. At the same time, if the excitability in such men takes the direction of courage or a sense of honour, they may be very useful in inferior positions in war, because the action in war over which commanders in inferior positions have control is generally of shorter duration. Here one courageous resolution, one effervescence of the forces of the soul, will often suffice. A brave attack, a soul-stirring hurrah, is the work of a few moments, whilst a brave contest on the battlefield is the work of a day, and a campaign the work of a year. Owing to the rapid movement of their feelings, it is doubly difficult for men of this description to preserve equilibrium of the mind. Therefore, they frequently lose head, and that is the worst phase in their nature as respects the conduct of war. But it would be contrary to experience to maintain that very excitable spirits can never preserve a steady equilibrium. That is to say, they cannot do so even under the strongest excitement. Why should they not have the sentiment of self-respect? For, as a rule, they are men of a noble nature. This feeling is seldom wanting in them, but it has not the time to produce an effect. After an outburst, they suffer most from a feeling of inward humiliation. If through education, self-observance, and experience of life, they have learned, sooner or later, the means of being on their guard, so that at the moment of powerful excitement they are conscious betimes of the counteracting force within their own breasts, then even such men may have great strength of mind. Lastly, those who are difficult to move, but on that account susceptible of very deep feelings, Men who stand in the same relation to the proceeding as red heat to a flame are the best adapted by means of their titanic strength to roll away the enormous masses by which we may figuratively represent the difficulties which beset command in war. The effect of their feelings is like the movement of a great body, slower but more irresistible. Although such men are not so likely to be suddenly surprised by their feelings and carried away so as to be afterwards ashamed of themselves, like the preceding, still it would be contrary to experience to believe that they can never lose their equanimity or be overcome by blind passion. On the contrary, this must always happen whenever the noble pride of self-control is wanting, or as often as it has not sufficient weight. We see examples of this most frequently in men of noble minds belonging to savage nations, where the low degree of mental cultivation favours always the dominance of the passions. But even amongst the most civilised classes in civilised states, life is full of examples of this kind of men carried away by the violence of their passions, like the poacher of old, chained to the stag in the forest. We therefore say once more a strong mind is not one that is merely susceptible of strong excitement, but one which can maintain its serenity under the most powerful excitement, so that in spite of the storm in the breast, the perception and judgment can act with perfect freedom like the needle of the compass in the storm-tossed ship. By the term strength of character, or simply character, is denoted tenacity of conviction. Let it be the result of our own or others' views, and whether they are principles, opinions, momentary inspirations, or any other kind of emanations of the understanding. But this kind of firmness certainly cannot manifest itself if the views themselves are subject to frequent change. This frequent change need not be the consequence of external influences. It may proceed from the continuous activity of our own mind, in which case it indicates a characteristic unsteadiness of mind. 
Evidently, we should not say of a man who changes his views every moment, however much the motives of the change may originate with himself, that he has character. Only those men, therefore, can be said to have this quality whose conviction is very constant, either because it is deeply rooted and clear in itself, little liable to alteration, or because, as in the case of indolent men, there is a want of mental activity and therefore a want of motives to change. Or lastly, because an explicit act of will, derived from an imperative maxim of the understanding, refuses any change of opinion up to a certain point. Now in war, owing to the many and powerful impressions to which the mind is exposed, and in the uncertainty of all knowledge and of all science, more things occur to distract a man from the road he has entered upon, to make him doubt himself in others, than in any other human activity. The harrowing sight of danger and suffering leads to the feelings gaining ascendancy over the conviction of the understanding, and, in the twilight which surrounds everything, a deep clear view is so difficult that a change of opinion is more conceivable and more pardonable. It is, at all times, only conjecture or guesses at truth which we have to act upon. This is why differences of opinion are nowhere so great as in war, and the stream of impressions acting counter to one's own convictions never ceases to flow. Even the greatest impassibility of mind is hardly proof against them because the impressions are so powerful in their nature, and always act at the same time upon the feelings. When the discernment is clear and deep, none but the general principles and views of action from a high standpoint can be the result. And on these principles, the opinion, in each particular case immediately under consideration, lies, as it were, at anchor. But to keep to these results of bygone reflection, in opposition to the stream of opinions and phenomena which the present brings with it, is just the difficulty. Between the particular case and the principle, there is often a wide space which cannot always be traversed on a visible chain of conclusions. And where a certain faith in self is necessary and a certain amount of scepticism is serviceable, here often nothing else will help us but an imperative maxim which, independent of reflection, at once controls it. That maxim is, in all doubtful cases, adhere to the first opinion, and do not give it up until a clear conviction forces us to do so. We must firmly believe in the superior authority of well-tried maxims, and under the dazzling influence of momentary events, not forget that their value is of an inferior stamp. By this preference, which in doubtful cases we give to first convictions, by adherence to the same our actions acquire the stability and consistency which make up what is called character. It is easy to see how essential a well-balanced mind is to strength of character. Therefore, men of strong minds generally have a great deal of character. Force of character leads to a spurious variety of it, obstinacy. It is often very difficult in concrete cases to say where the one ends and the other begins. On the other hand, it does not seem difficult to determine the difference in idea. Obstinacy is no fault of the understanding. We use the term as denoting a resistance against our better judgment, and it would be inconsistent to charge that to the understanding, as the understanding is the power of judgment. Obstinacy is a fault of the feelings or the heart, this inflexibility of will, this impatience of contradiction, have their origin only in a particular kind of egotism, which sets above every other pleasure that of governing both self and others by its own mind alone. We should call it a kind of vanity were it not decidedly something better. Vanity is satisfied with mere show, but obstinacy rests upon the enjoyment of the thing. We say, therefore, force of character degenerates into obstinacy whenever the resistance to opposing judgments proceeds not from better convictions or a reliance upon a trustworthy maxim, but from a feeling of opposition. If this definition, as we have already admitted, is of little assistance practically, still it will prevent obstinacy from being considered merely force of character intensified, whilst it is something entirely different, something which certainly lies close to it, and is cognate to it, but is at the same time so little an intensification of it, that there are very obstinate men who, from want of understanding, have very little force of character. Having in these attributes of a great military commander made ourselves acquainted with those qualities in which heart and head cooperate, we now come to a speciality of military activity which perhaps may be looked upon 
as the most marked, if not the most important, and which only makes a demand on the power of the mind without regard to the forces of the feelings. It is the connection which exists between war and country or ground. This connection is, in the first place, a permanent condition of war, for it is impossible to imagine our organised armies affecting any operation otherwise than in some given space. It is, secondly, of the most decisive importance, because it modifies, at times completely alters, the action of all forces. Thirdly, while on the one hand it often concerns the most minute features of locality, on the other it may apply to immense tracts of country. In this manner, a great peculiarity is given to the effect of this connection of war with country and ground. If we think of other occupations of man which have a relation to these objects, on horticulture, agriculture, on building houses and hydraulic works, on mining, on the chase, and forestry, they are all confined within very limited spaces, which may be soon explored with sufficient exactness. But the commander in war must commit the business he has in hand to a corresponding space, which his eye cannot survey, which the keenest zeal cannot always explore, and with which, owing to the constant changes taking place, he can also serve.